Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. Well, we have a debate right now. Um, debate between Anthony Rogers and Andrew Griffin on the topic, does the Gospel of John teach that Jesus is God? Uh, I could give introductions for these guys, but I figure I would just let them introduce themselves. So uh, the first speaker this evening will be Anthony Rogers. Anthony, why don't you take about a minute or so to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, let me first uh, give all praise and thanks to my Lord and my God who became flesh and loved me and died for me. Uh, my name is Anthony, as you said. I have a wife and four children. I'm an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church of America. Uh, in that capacity, I serve as the regional director in South Carolina for Metanoia Prison Ministries. I also uh, have long been engaged in evangelism and apologetics. And in that capacity, I work with the infamous David Wood. That's uh, pretty shameful, Anthony. All right, uh, Andrew, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself for everyone? Yeah, my name's Andrew. I'm a nobody special. Just um, a local internet theologian with ADD and a library card. Um, honestly, I um, grew up in the church, took a break from the church, came back to the church, was saved in a oneness Pentecostal church, believed that Jesus was almighty God as a man. I later um, found, um, felt the need to explain and articulate my belief and when i dove into the text i got a revelation of what i believe is rediscovering what the bible originally taught to its original audience and i haven't stopped since and i'm always learning and growing and i'm honored to be here with you guys discussing this today all uh, right thank you anthony and andrew let me just run through the format with everyone here and then we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, format will be 20-minute uh, opening statements. Anthony will begin. Uh, so 20 minutes, then 20 minutes, and then we'll have 10-minute first rebuttals. After our first rebuttals, we will have 10 minutes each of cross-examination. The first 10 minutes will be Anthony asking Andrew questions, and then the next 10 minutes will be Andrew asking Anthony questions. Um, then we'll have uh, five-minute second rebuttals, five-minute third rebuttals, and five-minute conclusions. And uh, after the formal part of the debate is done, uh, both debaters have agreed to take some questions uh, from the chat. And if they see questions that they want to answer, they're free to pick out questions they want to answer. I'll also be looking for uh, questions. And, and really, if, if, if one of them sees a question that they would like the other to answer, they're, they're welcome to toss that in there. But basically, we're going to try and go back and forth with a question for Anthony and then a question for Andrew and so on. And we could basically do that for a, uh, for a little bit. All right. Well, uh, I guess we're going to, are there any other issues guys before we get started? Nope. Okay. Well, Anthony is going to be speaking first. Andrew, I would ask you to turn off your mic, uh, so that, uh, so that, uh, if you're typing or, or looking, looking up something, then, uh, we won't, we won't hear the noise. And then I'll have Anthony do the same when, uh, when Andrew is speaking. So Anthony, um, I'm going, I'm, I'm assuming you can see me or that you'll be, uh, looking at time, but, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you time signals, but you'll be the only thing on the screen for the viewers. And basically, uh, once you get to 20 minutes, I'll be, you'll see a fist on the camera. Uh, that will be me. And that means your, your 20 minutes is up. Finish up your thought. Uh, if you go, you know, 10, 10 or 15 seconds beyond that, then I'm, then I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Uh, everything. All right. Yep. All right. Then, uh, let me go ahead and put you just you on screen and I will start your time whenever you start speaking. All right. Uh, two things are of utmost importance in rightly interpreting the testimony of John's gospel with respect to the identity of Christ, namely the opening prologue, which introduces us to uh, themes that will be developed later in the narrative, and the thesis statement found in John 20:31, which tells us the theme that everything is pointing to. Uh, any understanding of Christ's identity that doesn't deal squarely with these two issues misses John's point, both coming and going. Accordingly, it's on these two issues that I'll focus. I begin then with John's thesis statement in 2031, the purpose for which he wrote his gospel. 
John writes, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, if we isolate out the phrase, the Son of God, and ask what could this phrase mean, uh, we have a number of options. It could mean that Jesus is Son of God by virtue of creation, or by adoption, or because of the virgin birth, or it could mean that Jesus is really and truly the Son of God by nature, and therefore true deity. With these options in mind, when we take this phrase and place it back in its immediate and broader Johannine context, it can only be understood in the latter sense. John can't be saying that Jesus is the Son of God by virtue of creation for various reasons. First, if all John wanted to say is that Jesus is a Son of God in this sense, it would be a colossal redundancy and nothing more than what any Jew or God-fearing Gentile already believed. God is the Father of all by virtue of creation. Second, believing that all human beings are sons of God by creation certainly isn't a saving truth. But John, in 2031, twice states that it's through confessing this about Jesus that one has eternal life. Uh, as well, it's just as clear that Jesus can't be the Son of God in an adoptive sense. First, John carefully and consistently distinguishes between Christ as the Son, ha -huyos, and others as God's children, tekna theou, by using different Greek words, as I just noted. Uh, second, uh, uh, Jesus is not a son of God by becoming a son, whereas others become children of God, John 1.12. Moreover, they become children of God through faith in the Son, John 1, 12 again, and it's because of his death, 11, 51, and 52. Jesus did not become a son by believing in anyone or by someone dying for him. He's the Redeemer, not a redeemed son. As well, with respect to the virgin birth, uh, this is nowhere mentioned in John's Gospel, and therefore it can't be what John intended to convey when he said that Jesus is the Son of God, the chief purpose of his Gospel. Moreover, Christ's sonship preceded the incarnation, for as John, uh, Jesus said in John 17, Father, referring to himself therefore as the Son, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world became. To say then that Jesus' uh, sonship goes beyond sonship by creation, beyond adoption, and beyond the virginal conception, and in fact was true of him before coming into the world, and even before the world became, mounts up to that transcendent and divine sonship confessed by all Orthodox Christians. This divine sonship, moreover, is brought out by John in several noteworthy ways. First, by employing a monadic use of the article, John points to Jesus as the Son of God rather than simply a Son of God, and thus sets him apart from others in a category all his own. The implications of this are intensified elsewhere when John refers to Jesus as the monogenes huios, the only begotten son. In fact, in uh, all four occurrences of monogenes in John's gospel, it underscores the divine import of Christ's sonship. For example, in John 1.14, it's connected with such well-known Old Testament motifs as glory, grace, and truth. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, abounding in grace and truth, which, by the way, is a comparable Greek expression of God's self-identification to Moses when it says that he revealed his receding glory to him and then declared that he is abounding in faithfulness and truth. Moreover, what John literally says here is that Jesus is the only begotten who came from alongside the Father, para patros in the Greek, something Jesus himself said in John 7, 29. I know him, the Father, because I am from him, from alongside him. In John 1, 18, it's because Jesus is the only begotten that he is exclusively and perfectly able to reveal the Father to men. No man, John writes, has seen God at any time, but God, the only begotten, the one being in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. 
The articular participle, ha'on, the being, or the one being, which is used here for the Son, is the same phrase used for God in Exodus 3.14. Ego emi ha'on, I am the being. Well, a second way that uh, uh, the divine significance of Christ's sonship is seen is in those passages where it's said to entail a claim to deity, which certain apostate Jews, anticipating contemporary Unitarianism, took to be blasphemous. For uh, example, in response to the Jews uh, in John 5 who objected to Jesus performing a divine miracle on the Sabbath when only God uh, could work, he sustains and governs the world, Jesus said, my father is working until now and I myself am working. In both cases, Jesus uses the present middle uh, indicative uh, for the word work, uh, and which are uh, present uh presence of past action still in progress. In other words, what he's saying is the Father has been working throughout the past all the way up until the present day, and then he says, and so have I. Uh, in other words, he claims that his works are coextensive with the works of the Father throughout the past until the present. And then John goes on to say, for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Uh, for this uh, claim, they wanted to kill him all the more, John says, uh, because he kept on claiming, in fact, it's iterative in the Greek, he kept on claiming that God is his own Father. And precisely because this was his constant claim, they understood his sonship as a claim of equality with God. Another example of this sort of thing is found in John 10. After repeatedly referring to God as his Father, and thus to himself as the Son, Jesus again makes the sense of his Sonship clear by pointing to himself as the shepherd of the sheep, uh, the one who's able to effectually call them by the power of his voice and give eternal life, such that no one is able to snatch them out of his hand, which is an echo of Yahweh's words in Deuteronomy 32:39. Behold now that I am, and there's no God besides me, I put to death and make alive, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. So precisely because this is the way by which Jesus defined his sonship, we read, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him, hearkening back to John 5, again uh, to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. This, then, is the thesis of John's Gospel, the very thing that John intended to be understood from everything he chose to recount. Jesus is the Son of God, the only begotten, the one abounding in grace, truth, and glory, the one who has always been with the Father, has seen the Father, and can reveal the Father, the one who has always been at work with the Father, and is equal with the Father, and therefore truly and properly God. Well, with, with that said, I want to turn now to my second area of focus, the prologue of John's Gospel. Here, there are two issues that need to be addressed. Namely, that the word, ha-logos, in Greek, is a personal title of the Lord Jesus. And second, Jesus, as that personal word, is fully divine. According to Andrew and other Unitarians, some Unitarians, the word is not a person, and thus uh, it's not a personal title or name for Jesus. For, for Jesus. Uh, as Andrew said on Facebook, uh, the logos is God's rationale. Well, if so, then the Logos must be something internal to the mind of God, unless Andrew wants to divorce God from his rationality. In stark contrast to this, uh, John says uh, that the word was with God, ein pros ton theon. Pros in Greek is a directional term, not a possessive one. You don't speak of a person's internal rationale being with that person. Every time the Greek New Testament says, Prostantheon, except when preceded by the neuter pronoun, it always refers to persons because the uh, term is relational. Moreover, uh, here it's used with the stative, stative verb was, and so must be speaking of a person being with God. 
Uh, this identification of the word as a person rather than an abstraction also appears from the personal pronouns used throughout the prologue. Uh, while it's certainly true that hutas in uh, verse 2, the demonstrative masculine uh, pronoun, is sometimes used, uh, rarely, of uh, impersonal things, its most regular usage is for a person. And the most natural meaning here, in light of the foregoing, uh, is personal. This one, he, was in the beginning with God, in verse 2. Even more definitive is the way autan, the third person pronoun, he, is used throughout the context. For example, in John 1, 3, it says of the word, all things through him became, di autu egeneta. Since dia, through, is used with the genitive form of the pronoun, it must mean agency. So the logos, John says, was the agent of creation. This same agent, the word, must be the one in view in verse 10 as well, for verse 10 says, he was in the world, and the world through him became, di autu egeneta. Not only is the phrase in verse 10 identical to the phrase in verse 3, but since autu is a masculine singular and must agree with its antecedent in gender and number, it must refer back to the word. And here, here is the clincher. After saying that the word was uh, in the world and the world became through him, John goes on to say, the world did not know him, autan, uk egno, he came to his own and his own did not receive him, him, autan. But as many as did receive him, autan, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those believing in his name, ta anama autu. So the word was with God, is the agent of creation, and people become the children of God by believing in his name. Clearly, the word is a person. In fact, uh, the very one who became flesh, according to verse 14. No wonder the same John said in Revelation 19:13 about Jesus, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. From his mouth extends a sharp sword so that with it he can strike the nations. Ironically, whereas Unitarians often accuse Christians of having notions of God derived from pagan philosophy rather than scripture, Andrew's notion of the Logos is nothing more than the impersonal Logos of pagan philosophers uh, like Heraclitus or the Stoics that Paul argued against in Acts 17. What makes this doubly ironic is that Andrew also claims that his pagan impersonal Logos is actually the Logos of ancient Judaism. To quote Andrew again, the Logos is not a person. It never was throughout history and is not in the New Testament. If you don't understand Jewish culture, it's easy to impose Western thinking on the text and it's a mistake to do so, end quote. But this is exactly what Andrew's doing, imposing Greek notions of the Logos on ancient Judaism. In opposition to this, the Old Testament itself often speaks of the word as personal. For example, Genesis 15, 1 and 5 says that the word of the Lord appeared to Abram, the word spoke to Abram, and the word took Abram outside of his tent. Elsewhere, the Old Testament speaks of the word being sent, uh, Psalm 107, of the word running swiftly, Psalm 147, and of the word returning to God, Isaiah 55. Because of this kind of Old Testament phenomena, uh, pre-Christian Jews, uh, Jewish sources also spoke of God's word as thoroughly personal. For example, in the pre-Christian Jewish book of wisdom, in chapter 18, speaking of the slaying of the Egyptian firstborn, it says, your all-powerful word from heaven's royal throne bounded a fierce warrior into the doomed land, bearing the sharp sword of your inexorable decree. And as he alighted, he filled every place with death. He still reached to heaven while he stood upon the earth." End quote. Here again, the word, notice, is identified as a person, for he's spoken of as a warrior that came from heaven to earth, wielding the sword of God's judgment. Moreover, he's identified as a divine person, for he's an occupant of the divine throne. And he's called all-powerful. Uh, he's identified, uh, he's uh, 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 omnipresent because he fills heaven and earth. 
Uh, and notice, by the way, that the picture here is strikingly similar to John's description of Jesus in Revelation 19, who comes from heaven to earth bearing the sharp sword, the sword that protrudes out of his mouth, and he's called the Word of God. As well, the ancient Jewish Targums, uh, Targum Neophyti, for example, on De uh, Deuteronomy 4, it says, uh, the word of the Lord sits upon his throne, high and lifted up, and hears our prayers whenever we pray before him. Likewise, in Targum Neophyti on Deuteronomy 26, it says, this day you have made the word of the Lord your God to be king over you, so that he may be for you a savior God. To echo the words of the late Alfred Edersheim, uh, if words have any meaning, the word, according to these sources, is a person. Now this leads to my second point about the prologue. The word is not only a person, but fully divine. John indicates this in a multitude of ways. I'll just note three of them. First, in the opening verse of the prologue, John pointedly says, the word was God. In fact, John makes this declaration emphatic by placing God, theos, at the beginning of the Greek sentence. And since God is an, an arthurist predicate nominative that precedes the verb, it, it shouldn't be understood as indefinite, a God, like the JW translation says, since there are no certain examples of such a construction bearing an indefinite sense. Uh, and so, therefore, it must refer to the word as God in either a definite sense or a qualitative sense. Now, it can't be definite because uh, this would collapse the personal distinction uh, that John has already made between the Logos and the one he was with, and so it must be uh, understood in a qualitative sense. In other words, it means just what it says in all standard translations. The word was God, meaning God by nature, qualitatively. Second, Jesus, uh, or John, excuse me, makes an equally decisive statement about the deity of the word at the end of the prologue coming and going, when he wrote, no man has seen God at any time, God, the only begotten, the one being in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. Here again, John speaks of Jesus being with God, namely at the Father's side, and likewise refers to Jesus as God, furthermore identifying him as the one who alone has seen the Father since he's at the Father's side, and as the one apart from whom no one has seen uh, God. This explains why Jesus said he's the only one who has seen the Father in John 5 and John 6, and also explains why John 12 says that Isaiah's vision of God in his heavenly temple was in fact a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, this is uh, all the more poignant in John's Gospel since the Targum of Isaiah 6 says, I heard the voice of the word of the Lord, the Logos, saying, Whom shall I send to prophesy? Third, since the prologue begins and ends on the same note, emphatically identifying Jesus as God, the only begotten, and the Word who was God, it's hardly surprising that these declarations in the introductory prologue would find an equally emphatic declaration at the end and climax of the narrative. When Thomas, upon seeing the risen Lord, fell down at his feet and said to him, My Lord and my God. Grammatically, there's no question that Thomas applied both titles to Jesus, and since Thomas was a monotheistic uh, Jew and not a pagan, he could only have said such a thing if he believed Jesus to be Yahweh. Moreover, Jesus blessed Thomas's confession, and this brings us full circle to how I started, for it's hard upon the heels of this climactic confession that John gives us his thesis statement, thus reinforcing all that I said earlier about the true and correct understanding of Christ as the Son of God. To say that Jesus is the Son of God and thus have eternal life is not to say that he's a son by virtue of creation or by adoption or uh, miraculous birth or in any other way than to confess with Thomas the full unabridged deity of Jesus Christ. This is what it means to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Those who possess this have eternal life. Those who do not, do not have eternal life. Now, uh, I do want to say something. Oh, time's oh, up? Yes, your time is up, sir. Okay. And uh, since I, since uh, you actually paid attention to the fist this time, you only went five seconds over, which is uh, a, a record for you, Anthony. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 
we're gonna just get reset real quick anthony i would ask you to turn off your mic so that there's no interruption of andrew and andrew if you could turn your mic back on as soon as everyone's ready we can go ahead and get started all right i'm ready okay <clears throat> just let me uh get you up on the screen without uh without any of the rest of us and i will start your 20 minutes whenever you start speaking and uh again i'll be uh if you can see me i'm giving hand signals until uh so i'll give you a five three two one minute and then a fist for your time's up and then you can uh you can wrap up your thought there so uh i'll go ahead and start whenever uh whenever you start speaking all right so the gospel of john right someone might wonder why would in the world would a unitarian want to debate the gospel of john it seems like the last place that a Unitarian would want to be if he wants to argue against the the godness or deity, as Anthony says, abstract word deity there. That's not what we're debating, but that's okay. What he says is, so why would anyone, because if, if you have a conversation with somebody, if I have, in my experience is that if you have a conversation with somebody, and you try to tell them Jesus is not God, what are they going to tell you? The first thing they're going to tell you, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. Isn't it clear that Jesus is God? How about Thomas, my Lord and my God? Isn't it obvious that Jesus is God? Well, I believe that I've rediscovered, along with several others, the original message before it got buried in dogma and extra-biblical speculations, what the true meaning of John is in its proper cultural context. All right, so first, I, w I think it's important to define what and why we are debating, right? So first, I think it's important that we identify and clarify exactly what it is that we're debating here. We're debating, does the gospel of John teach that Jesus is God? Now, of course, I hope that we agree that when we say God, we're referring to the supremely intelligent, supremely powerful being who created everything that exists. Not God in the sense that the Aryans would say, and not God in the sense a, a, like a man like Moses or the Messiah like David was called God by God, or how Old Testament human judges may be called gods as such, as Jesus tells us in John 10:34. Not a lowercase g God or an abstract definition of God given by later Trinitarians such as deity, but rather Jesus is simply not the supremely intelligent, supremely powerful being such as the Father clearly and indisputably is. For this opening statement, I will be breaking down my argument into four sections. In the first section, I want to talk about a few significant cultural contexts I believe are important when trying to understand John's gospel. Second, I want to briefly touch on John's prologue, the separate introductory portion of John's gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, but more specifically on John 1, 1 itself. Thirdly, I want to talk about different roles of the Father and Son throughout the gospel of John. And fourthly, and lastly, I want to talk about why John said he wrote the Gospel of John, and then I will summarize and close my opening statement. First, a few cultural evidences to consider. The first is the Roman imperial context in which John's Gospel is written. At the time, John's Gospel is most widely held to believe to have been written around 90 AD. The Roman historian Suetonius writes that the emperor Domitian, quote, began issuing a circular letter saying, Our Lord and our God bids that this be done, and so the custom arose henceforth of addressing him in no other way, even in writing in conversation, end quote. It's important to note that in this historical context, that it is not unusual for emperors to bear the titles God or Son of God, and that by bearing that title, they were not to be confused with the gods they represent. Even in the Old Testament, we see men called gods, even by Jesus himself in John 10, 34 again. And also, perhaps most notably, the Messiah, probably either David or Solomon, who is called God by God himself in Psalm 2-7 at his coronation ceremony. The emperors were to their false gods what the Messiah was to the one true God. Messiahs were anointed by God, empowered by God, authorized by God, and even worshipped alongside God, as we see in 1 Chronicles 29-20. 
the more reasonable conclusion to see this utterance of Thomas, my Lord and my God, is in part a polemic against the emperor. Thomas would have been referring to Jesus there in the sense that other men in the Bible and emperors at that time were called God. It doesn't make sense that Jesus resurrected. Now all of a sudden Thomas realized Jesus was the supremely intelligent, supremely powerful being on account of his resurrection. All right, another Jewish context, cultural context we're going to want to consider at the time or, or how Jewish people understood intermediaries. Within the context of Second Temple period, there were from within Judaism numerous theories concerning various intermediary figures. There were theories uh, coming forth about the archangel Michael, the angel of the Lord, the one like the son of man in the vision of Daniel, even figures such as Yahuwah and later Metatron. Charles Geishen puts forth several criterions for measuring the divinity of an intermediary, such as the position near God, divine appearance, such as depicted in various theophanies, divine functions the intermediary may carry out. Does this figure possess the divine name? Are they the object of some sort of veneration? Geishen goes on to note the presence of one or more of these five criteria in a text may indicate that an angelomorphic mediator figure was understood to share God's status, authority, and nature. So, end quote, so different intermediary figures were measured on their various levels of their divinity. All right, most important to note that these figures were intermediaries. No matter what level of divinity these figures were said to have, they were still intermediaries between God and men, communicators of the divine will. An intermediary is defined as a person who acts as a link between people in order to try to bring about an agreement or reconciliation. You can't be both an intermediary and that which is being mediated. A mediator, mediator can't be of God and also be God himself. Also, various theories concerning the wisdom in the Lagos, various theories concerning whether or not wisdom in God's Lagos were to be seen as independent beings alongside God. For instance, in Proverbs 8, Yahweh possessed me at the beginning, before his works of old. From everlasting I was established, from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields nor the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. So the several elements of the criteria are met when we're examining wisdom. Wisdom is in the presence of God. Wisdom is portrayed as having an intimate relation with Yahweh. It's said to have existed with God prior to the heavens and earth being established. And later in verse 30, wisdom is said to have participated in creation alongside God. So there's essentially two views here, differing views. One, we can see wisdom as a personification of a manifestation of the one God, Yahweh. Or two, as many Trinitarians believe, that wisdom is an actual person alongside, uh, alongside God, who many Trinitarians often identify as the pre-incarnate Christ. The true question is, are we to see wisdom as a personified manifestation of God or as an actual person alongside God? And how we answer that question will greatly impact how we are, are going to understand the Logos in John's Gospel. Second, I think it's important that we take a brief walk through the prologue, pro focusing primarily on John 1. In the beginning was the word. Already we see the eternality of the word. Again, are we going to see the word here as personified manifestation of the one true God, or are we to see the word as an actual person alongside the one true God? The word was with God. A second criterion for the divinity of the word. The word is said to be in the presence of God. Again, this word was in the presence of Almighty God, just as wisdom is said to be in the presence of Almighty God. The word is said to be prostantheon, an intimate relation facing towards the word directed towards God. But next we read something very interesting. The Logos was Theos. We know that the person whom with the word was intimate relation was the Father alone. That's hardly disputed. I don't think Anthony would dispute that suggestion. So the question we have to ask here is what does it mean that the Logos was Theos? And there's two, essentially two schools of thought here relevant to this debate. Although within the two schools of thought, there are differences. But essentially, we can see that Theos in John 1.1c, one of two ways in this discussion. 
we can see the Logos too was Almighty God, so that the understanding is Almighty God was with Almighty God. But the understanding that seems most reasonable to me primarily stems from an understanding of the Word of God being spoke about as the uh, as the Word of God. Um, uh, as the word of God that, that doesn't that consistently doesn't appear to be a person separate from God, but secondarily from an ancient source. Uh, I just butchered that. Sorry. Um, here we go. But anyways, but we see the word of God secondarily from an ancient source prior to the Gospel of John from a Jewish philosopher named Philo. The Jewish philosopher Philo writes concerning this very matter, concerning the Logos, what the Logos is, and how it is referred to as Theos without the article. He says on his book on dreams, it is the true God that is meant by use of the article, the expression being I am the God. But when the word Theos is used incorrectly, catechistically or figuratively, it is to be put without the article and what he calls God here without the article is his most ancient word. All right, so I believe with this ancient source from the foremost Logos theorist, Philo and the rest of the usage of Logos within the book of John, the Old Testament and major intertestamental works, the best way to describe the Logos is the polyvalent word of God. The Logos within Hellenistic Judaism, if not seen as an actual intermediary person, is actually described as the mind of God, the reasoning of God, and like in John's prologue, is essentially synonymous with wisdom in the intertestamental period, and I believe in John's prologue as well. All things came to be through the word, and without the word, not one thing came into being that came into being. So A, not only the creation of the universe, but B, also the word through which God governs the course of history. Um, for instance, the word of the Lord is often said to come to the prophets, right? No matter how the message or words were communicated, whether angel or vision or dream or manifest in creation, the word originated from a single being who's clearly the father, who's clearly the supremely intelligent, supremely powerful being. Janet Tolington says concerning the word of the Lord, the message always comes to the prophet in a personal way through an encounter with Yahweh, and the content is generally referred to as the word of the Lord. All right. So, and finally, so if we're to see the Logos as personified manifestation of God in John 1, 1 it, as poetic in nature, then there's no reason why we shouldn't carry that understanding down to for, for, verse 14 when the word is said to become flesh. Again, Jesus, as the word made flesh, continue to make only the Father known as God has always done through his word. All right, so number three. Uh, various roles of the Father and Son throughout the Gospel. The Father is the supreme object of revelation and worship. No one has seen God but Jesus, right? They say, the, the disciples say, show us the Father. That will be enough for us, right? Jesus says, whenever you see me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because Jesus represented the Father to the world and still does, right? And so the Father is the, the sole possessor of the divine will. Jesus says repeatedly, I came not to do my own will, but the will of the Father. Much like the Jewish laws of Shaliach, which says an agent is like the one who sent him, Jesus is portrayed as a subordinate authorized agent of God. For instance, he only speaks the words and teachings that he received from his Father. Jesus seeks the will and glory of the Father and not his own. The Father initiates the mission which Jesus carried out. For instance, John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, right? God is the mastermind, the supremely intelligent being who orchestrates all these events. Jesus simply follows orders. Once response to the Son is considered his response to the Father who sent him, since the Father, since the Son is the Father's representative. John 5, 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so also he granted the Son to have life in himself. John 17, 2, Jesus is given authority, and uh, we read that, uh, John 10, my father who has given the sheep to me is greater than all. If Jesus were God, he would not need to be given anything because he would already possess it. And the father is said to be the only one who solely possesses the authority and the sheep given to Jesus. Jesus is also known in the fourth gospel as the king, the son of God, the Messiah, the son of man and the lamb of God, none of which denote him to be God himself. Wrapping up. John writes in chapter 20, verse 31, but these signs have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, 
the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Notice that the two titles, Christ or Messiah and Son of God, are used synonymously in the fourth gospel. That's because Son of God is a messianic title, not to give the impression that God had an actual son. The purpose of the gospel was so that people could come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. John bore witness that this was the Son of God. If you're the Son of God, that means you're not God. Respectfully, that's how language works. Simon Peter says in John 1.41, we have found the Messiah. Nathaniel says in John 1.49, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are King of Israel. In John 4, the Samaritan woman at the well, after perceiving Jesus was a prophet, the woman says to him, Sir, I, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then she says, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. Jesus says to her, I who am speaking with you am he. So the woman asks, could this be the Messiah? And her people know that this is truly the savior of the world, a title given to many emperors at that time. All right. Martha, sister of Lazarus in John eleven twenty seven, 27, says to Jesus, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the son of God, the one coming into the world. Finally, the chief priests and scribes reject Jesus as Messiah and king and, and instead declare they have no king but Caesar. And Thomas, upon resurrection, discovers that Jesus is truly the Messiah, my Lord and my God, meaning that Jesus and not an emperor is God's true representative. So to summarize, we've looked at a few significant cultural factors to consider when understanding John's gospel, namely the imperial context of the time and how intermediaries were understood at the time. We also looked briefly at the prologue in John and showed how and, and showed how we understand wisdom and, and such as in Proverbs 8, how we understand wisdom, such as in Proverbs 8, greatly impacts our view of how we should see the Logos in John 1. should be clear that wisdom in Proverbs 8 is not an actual person, but rather a personified manifestation of the one God who is the Father alone. We also looked at various roles of the Father and Son, showing the Father to be, um, showing the Father, uh, butchered this one again, sorry. Um, showing the Father to be superior and the Son acting on God's behalf as his authorized agent. Finally, we close showing that the entire Gospel of John, even according to John himself, was that people may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, they may have life in his name. And I'll end right there. All right. Um, um, Andrew finished under time. Um, why am I hearing myself? I don't know, but it must be miserable. <laughs> Let's see. All right. And we'll get. Uh... All right. Uh, Andrew, I would ask you to silence your mic again. And Anthony has already unsilenced himself, unfortunately. And so we are going to go into our first rebuttal session, ladies and gentlemen. And Anthony is going to give a 10-minute rebuttal, and this will be followed by a 10-minute rebuttal from Andrew. Uh, Anthony, let me go ahead and get you back up on the screen here by yourself. And all right, there you are. And I will, uh, again, start whenever you start going. Okay, uh, Andrew said uh, in his opening, both his personal introduction and the introduction to his opening statement, that he left the church and then came back to it through a uh, revelation that he got of a true understanding of who Jesus is. He even referred to this as a rediscovery, which, by the way, I would point out to you, is a hallmark of every heretical teaching under the sun, every false religion all claims that they got a true revelation a, and they rediscovered the truth. In other words, Andrew did not come to this understanding from the scriptures, certainly not from the Gospel of John, and we're about to be reminded why that's the case. In my opening presentation, I pointed out that Jesus is the Son of God in a transcendent sense. I gave numerous arguments for this. Andrew hasn't had his rebuttal chance yet, uh, but I can assure you he's not going to be able to rebut them uh, in the course of his rebuttal. 
However, uh, what he did say is he tried to link the title Son of God with Christ in such a way as to reduce the title Son of God to his lowered or reductionistic conception of Christ or Messiahship. However, the Old Testament itself does not speak of the Christ as merely a human being. In Isaiah 7:14, he is identified as Emmanuel, God with us. In Isaiah 9:6, he's called the Mighty God. In Jeremiah 23, he's called Yahweh, our righteousness. In Psalm 2, that's uh, not a hymn about David, it's about the Son. It doesn't use the term God there, by the way, like Andrew said. Uh, and then in Psalm 45 as well, the Messiah, the coming Messiah, is called God. That is not a coronation hymn for uh, pre-kings uh, uh, before Jesus. I reject that interpretation entirely. If Andrew wants to hold that, then he's going to have to offer some arguments for it. Uh, but by the way, he quoted a number of passages where it also connects Christ's sonship to his kingship. Here I'd say the same thing, that he's reducing Jesus to his lowered conception of kingship. In other words, he's thinking of Jesus as nothing more than another king in that long line of kings, like David and Solomon and so forth, rather than seeing all of them as uh, finite types pointing to the greater reality that's embodied in Jesus. In fact, Jesus rejected this lowered, earthly, earthbound conception of kingship in John 6:15. He rejected it in John 18, 33 through 38. Uh, rather, his kingship is to be understood in light of his sonship. Uh, precisely because he is the son, his kingship is a heavenly kingship, and his kingdom is not of this world. This is why John himself, in John 12, 15, identifies Christ's kingship as a fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9. Uh, the same Zechariah who goes on to say in chapter 14 about the king, Yahweh will be king over all the earth in that day. Yahweh will be one and his name one. So yes, Jesus is the son in the sense of being the king precisely because he's not an earthly king, he's a heavenly one, namely Yahweh who said he would be king over all the earth. Uh, Andrew uh, also said things like, this is how language works. In other words, if he's the Son of God, then he can't be God. Well, notice he's not thinking in terms of Jewish categories. He said a lot about uh, Roman cultural background and these sorts of things, which are uh, not as relevant as he thinks. They're not relevant in the way that he thinks. What's primarily relevant is how Jews thought. And according to the way Jews thought, if Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God in the way that he was claiming it, as the unique Son, the one whose works are coextensive with the Father throughout all past ages up until the present, they understood that as a claim of equality with God. The same thing goes in John chapter 10, when Jesus claimed to be the Son of God in such a way as to do exactly what the Father does. Notice he says, uh, you know, that, that Jesus is given the sheep. Notice what Jesus says. He's the one that gives them eternal life. He exercises that divine prerogative. He gives them life, and it's eternal life. He's giving them a divine gift. He also says that nobody can snatch them out of his hand. That's an echo of Deuteronomy 32, 39, something Yahweh says that he alone can do. And so Andrew's conception of sonship is inadequate. It's not consistent with the Old Testament. It's not consistent with the New Testament. And indeed, it really and truly is something that came to him outside of the Bible. But it certainly wasn't something that came to him from God. It was not a revelation from God. In fact, it's what John would identify uh, in 1 John uh, when he talks about testing the spirits as something that is uh, demonic ultimately in its origin. Now, he also tried to explain Thomas's confession uh, in, in light of this, not Jewish, but uh, Roman cultural context. And here he argued that the context is AD 90, uh, when he, and he quotes something from Domitian, uh, Domitian Emperor Domitian claiming uh, deity. However, that's irrelevant to John's Gospel because that isn't when John was written. I maintain on the basis of John's own words in John chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 that John was writing prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, which means prior to AD 70. Jesus refers in the present tense to Jerusalem as still intact, still standing when he wrote. Since John's Gospel is inspired and authoritative, as both of us agree, then his word trumps what anybody else wants to say later about it being uh, written much uh, longer after that. No, it was written long before uh, Domitian came on the scene. Of course, that doesn't mean other emperors didn't claim divinity, 
but it's irrelevant in interpreting how Thomas, a Jew, understood the, the words of Jesus, a Jew, that are recorded in a book by John, a Jew. They were certainly not thinking in pagan categories. They did not believe that Jesus was simply an earthly representative. Thomas does not say that, by the way. He doesn't say, you're God's Shalia. He doesn't say, you're God's representative. He said, my Lord and my God. Go check uh, the Old Testament. In fact, run a word search uh, throughout the entire Bible of the phrase, my God, and ask yourself, is this ever found on the lips of any godly person for anyone other than Yahweh? In fact, it isn't. In fact, the full phrase, my God and my Lord, is only found in Psalm 35, 23, where it's used for Yahweh. And the phrase, my God, is used scores of times only for Yahweh. Uh, and by the way, in Psalm 35, uh, the, the psalmist is praying, God, rise up, my, you're my God and my Lord. Guess what happened in uh, John 20? Jesus had arisen, and Thomas confessed him as my Lord and my God. Now, Andrew also pointed out things that he said uh, prove that there's a difference in roles between Jesus and the Father. I don't disagree with that. Of course Jesus is different in roles. Jesus is the Word become flesh. He sub uh, he, he became a human being and necessarily had all those things that go with that. Uh, as a human being, Jesus ate, he slept, he wept, he died. Uh, you know, Unitarians ask, basically like what Andrew's asking, you know, how could he have a God? How can he be given authority? Well, according to Jeremiah 32, God is the God of all flesh. That's how Jesus could say those sorts of things. Uh, according to uh, the Psalms, the person prays uh, because his flesh yearns for God. That accounts for Jesus praying. The Word became flesh. Over and over again, uh, you know, Unitarians think this sort of stuff somehow refutes what Christians believe, but all they're doing is arbitrarily pitting one thing that John says about Jesus, namely that he's God, against something else that John teaches, namely that the Word became flesh, and, and they think that by, uh, you know, arbitrarily choosing to accept one set of the, uh, truths that John says, uh, they're justified in rejecting the rest of what he says. But that's not believing the Bible, that's believing yourself. That's saying, I'm the criteria, what comports with my preconceived revelation outside the Bible is ultimately going to be how I determine what's true in the Bible, what's not true in the Bible, what I accept, what I don't accept. Now, Andrew actually shot himself in the foot, by the way, when he did talk about what Jews believed uh, in the Second Temple period. He mentioned that Jews believed in other uh, intermediary figures like Yahuel and Metatron and uh, even the Word. However, here he didn't do justice to what they taught. Uh, for one, he taught that the Word is impersonal, uh, and, he, and he even attributed this to Philo. I can't believe he's doing that. He did that in his debate with Sam Shamoon, and he was uh, uh, called out on it. But notice that the word, according to Philo, is a person. This is Philo uh, in his book, Who is the Heir? To his word, his chief messenger, highest in antiquity and honor, the father of all has given the special prerogative to stand on the border and separate the creature from the creator. This same word both pleads with the immortal as the suppliant uh, for afflicted mortality and acts as the ambassador of the ruler to the subject. Clearly, the word, according to Philo, is a person. Now, Andrew also appealed to Philo to justify his interpretation of John 1, uh, where Philo talks about the an arthurist uh, use of theos and the articular form of theos. That won't work with John's gospel. <clears throat> the preverbal predicate nominative is what I'm talking about in John 1, 1, and that cannot be uh, an arthurist. There are no certain examples of that construction in the Greek New Testament. Uh, the word has to be understood either definitely or qualitatively, and I argued already in my opening why it must be understood qualitatively, and therefore mean that what the word was, or what God was, the word was. The word by nature is God. The Word is God, according to John. The Word is God, according to verse 18. The Word is God, according to John 5, 18. The Word is God, according to John uh, 10, 30 and following. The Word is God, according to Thomas, who said, my Lord and my God. Wow. We've got Anthony, who only went two seconds over that time. He cut it down right when I held my fist up. So uh, this is a... Uh... 
Anthony's turning over a new leaf with time, so that is uh, good. Uh, there were some there were some people commenting that they heard my typing. I apologize for that. Uh, Vocab is apparently having an emergency on his YouTube channel that uh, absolutely could not wait. But I didn't know that. My, I saw your text coming through. I did not. Uh, I did not know that uh, that my typing was that loud. So I promise not to type anymore, even if Vocab cries all over me in the uh, in the the text here. Um, all right. Well, uh, Anthony, if you could turn you, if you could mute your mic, and Andrew, if you could turn yours back on, I will get Andrew up here on the screen by himself. And Andrew, Andrew, you can begin whenever. I'll start your time whenever you start talking, and you'll have ten minutes. All right. Sounds good. All right. First, I want to clarify what I actually said versus what Anthony said, that I left the church and then came up with some sort of revelation outside of the church. That's not what I said. I said I left the church and came back to the church. And, and actually, I had a radical encounter with Christ. He completely transformed my life to where forever he'll be my Lord and Savior. Right. I have no doubt about that. I know that Jesus um, Jesus is powerful. I don't blame people who call Jesus God because of the impact that Jesus and calling the name of Jesus has on people's life. All right. First of all, I had a lot of encounters with the church that's too much to go into and began to see flaws in the church system and different churches teaching different things. Well, how can it be, you know, required in this church is holy if they all teach different things? That's okay. But anyways, I stay dedicated. I stay as holy as I can. I read my Bible. My revelation comes from the Bible and honest, intellectually honest reasoning from historical um, sources, right? Incredible historical sources, right? Like so, all right, so, so first of all, I think it's really odd and strange that someone would believe that the word of God or personified wisdom would be an actual person, right? And he says that um, I, I have, it, that I shot myself in the foot and then proceeds to talk about how Jewish people believe these things were intermediaries, actual intermediaries. You got to understand different people thought different things. So some people thought that this Lagos or this angel of the Lord or this second power of the son of man was a second power, but some people didn't. Right. So we can't we can't throw a blanket on it and say, well, Jewish people thought this. Second, he talks about Philo. He wants to take a quote out of Philo. Right. And first of all, any honest uh any honest scholar that deals with primarily with Philo will tell you that Philo doesn't have a blanket um, definition for Lagos, that it's often all over the place and says different things. But I will quote something from Philo. He said, it is manifest also that the archetypal seal, which we call the world, which is perceptible only to the intellect, must itself be the archetypal model, the idea of ideas, the Lagos of God. Right. He goes on to say, um, he goes on to say, but the seal is an idea of ideas to which God fashioned the world being an incorporeal idea, comprehensible only to the intellect. Now, if you don't understand philosophically what Philo's saying there, then I can't really help you. If if that's the sole factor between understanding that Jesus or the word is not an actual person, feel free and we'll have a, con a real conversation, in-depth conversation about what Philo teaches and about what's really being said here to understand what the Lagos is, is a blueprint that God produced before he fashioned the world. If you don't understand that, that's okay, which is became synonymous even by Philo himself with wisdom. It's a produced manifestation of God. It's not an actual person. All right, so getting into a few things here, he says, he, he when he's quoting John 20, 31, he, he skips over really fast the Christ and then gets right to the Son of God and it continues to give some extra biblical cult revelation. He wants to throw throw stones here, right? But I, that's actually what he's doing over here because nowhere does it say that the Son of God means that somebody's begotten before all eternity and all these sort of things. He theorizes that and then po and imposes it on the text. That's an extra biblical revelation that wasn't even given until hundreds of years later. All right, so... So he wants to say that the, the, the Son of God is truly God by nature. He's the Son of God by nature, something that John doesn't teach. 
All right. So the, 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 the topic of the discussion is, does John teach that Jesus is God? Not does my theory imposed on the text um, uh, teach that Jesus is uh, God. So he throws true deity. He's trying to pull the wool over our eyes and say that Jesus can be called God because he's true deity again. Um, so and he says that by confessing that Jesus is the Christ and that's not what it says It says believing that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God Completely different things we can talk about it even the demons said Jesus was the Son of God But we have to believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God and that by believing that he is the Messiah the Son of God And he says that I give an extra biblical definition of what the Son of God is but yet in 2 Samuel 14, the Messiah, God says to the Messiah, I will be his father and he will be my son. What does that have to do with creation or Jesus being or being born of a virgin or, or him being born from his mother? It has nothing. It has to do with a filial relationship. God is going to take him under his wing. Jesus will be a son. Why even call Jesus a son? That's what I want to know from Anthony. Why even call Jesus a son? What does that mean if Jesus always existed? He was never a son. What is the purpose in calling him a son? I'd like to know that. This is not an extra biblical revelation in, in uh, Psalm 2-7. Today I have begotten you. This is repeated all throughout the New Testament. Today, a moment in time, I have begotten you, literally given birth to you to be my son. Who, who, so, you know, this, the idea that, that that's an extra biblical revelation is just nonsense. All right. And, and it, I, I find it honestly um, intellectually dishonest as well. All right. Um, he brings up about about um, Jesus being a, a shepherd along with God. Right. So 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 you got to understand that Trinitarians often take the shortest route possible when attempting to uh, exegete scripture. Right. They say, well, well, God was a shepherd and Jesus was a shepherd. Pfft. Jesus is God. That's the shortest route of reason uh, you could possibly take when trying to exegete Scripture. So let's give a perfect Old Testament background for what's being said in John 10. We'll look at Ezekiel 34. It says, The word of the Lord came to me again, the content that Yahweh was manifesting to me, Son of Man. Again, being called Son of Man doesn't mean you're anything special according to this thing, although he might be. He says, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to the shepherds, thus says Yahweh God, are you shepherds of Israel? You have been feeding yourselves. Another reason I left the false religious church system, but that's okay. I don't. I don't. I wonder what what church Jesus went to, right? He said, "Should not the shepherds feed their sheep?" Later, he says, "For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. I will be a shepherd of my sheep, and I will." And I will make them lie down. But how does he do it? He says, I will save my flock. But how is he doing it? Through the agency of the Messiah. Let's read Ezekiel 34, verse 23. I will set up over them. Again, God is the divine, uh, the, has the divine will and is the supremely intelligent being who's orchestrating this event. I'm going to tell you how I'm going to do it is what God's saying here. He says, I will set up over them my servant David. One shepherd, my servant David. This is not referring to King David, who's already been dead now for 300 years. So who is it referring to? Right. And he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, I, Yahweh, will be their God. And David, my servant, will be prince among them. So, again, Trinitarians want to take the shortest route possible and say, well, Jesus is, you know, he kind of says things right. You know, it's 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 Jesus saying enigmatic things or Jesus saying something like I and the father are one is not a license to dismiss everything we read in the whole Bible. This is not cult revelation. I'll read you straight from the Bible. I can prove everything from the Bible. I was just adding the extra biblical cultural references as a little icing on the cake. All right. So he talks about John 8. John 8 is one of the perfect examples of proving what Jesus thought it meant to be a son, right? Jesus says, I'm a son because I always do the things that are pleasing to my father. He says in the same chapter, he says that you're are, I know that you're descendants of Abraham. But then he says just a few verses later, if you were a, 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 ch a child of Abraham. He says, I know that you're a child of Abraham. Then says a few verses later, if you were children. Why? Because they were physical children of God, but they uh, of Abraham, but they were shown to be true children by doing the things that please God. Jesus was the son of God because he did the things that were pleasing to his father. And Jesus says, I always do the things that are pleasing to my father. What kind of narcissistic God do Trinitarians believe in? You really have to ask yourself that there. All right. So she talks about Jewish thought and doesn't want to give one quote from Philo as if that does it justice. 
Right? He claims I'm not giving it justice. Well, we're in a debate here. If we want to debate what the Jewish people thought at that time, let's set that up and let's make that happen. And we can focus primarily on that. But right now we're focusing on the gospel of John itself. He says that um, that John didn't say that Jesus was the agent. John doesn't have to because Jesus says it in the gospel of John repeatedly about how he's sent by God. As I showed in my opening statement, he's sent by God. He came not to do his own will. When you've seen Jesus, you've actually seen the Father. To honor Jesus is actually to honor the Father. Agency language couldn't be more clear by Jesus himself in the Gospel of John. It's not extra biblical revelation. This is straight from the from the Gospel of John itself. Right? It says Jesus rejected his kingship. Yes, that's right. Jesus re rejected kingship on earth. That's correct. So that he could be highly exalted. So that he could be highly exalted above all the kings of the earth. That's correct. And, you, and, and, and what happens in, so Jesus is already king, right? But in Daniel 7, what does it say? The son of man comes to the ancient of days and receives a kingdom. The ancient of days gives it to him. First Corinthians 15, it says that at the end, the, Jesus will hand the kingdom back. This is the created realm. Jesus is over the created realm and takes the, the world back for the created realm and gives it back to the Father, and then the Son is made eternally subordinate. All right. Uh, thank you, Andrew. And let me get everyone back up on screen here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to turn to the cross-examination. I'm going to get myself off screen here. And so uh, we will have... 10 minutes of Anthony Rogers asking questions and uh, Andrew will be answering. And then after that 10 minutes, then we will switch back. Uh, we will switch to Andrew asking questions for 10 minutes and Anthony answering them. So I'm going to get myself off the screen here and just put Andrew and oops, whoops. Now it's just me. That didn't go uh, like I planned. All right. And all right, here we go. All right, now we have Andrew and Anthony on the screen. So, Anthony, I will start the timer whenever you ask, when you start your first question. Okay. Um, all right, let's uh, begin with the prologue, Andrew. In the first verse, it says, The word was with God, ain prostantheon. Can you give me an example of anywhere in the entirety of Scripture where that construction is used to refer to something other than a person, to an abstraction. Uh, we can't hear you, Andrew. Andrew, are you talking? Uh, I apologize. You can oh, add okay. more time on that. I apologize. No problem. Uh, you guys can go. Uh, I won't be strict since you're both speaking here, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I believe there's several instances um, where things are said to be... Um, said to be um, faced towards God, right? We're talking um, about proston theon. One example yeah. where that construction is used uh, of anything other than a person being with God. Yeah, Hebrews 5, 1, for the high priest taken uh, from among men is ordained that's, for men in the things pertaining to God, proston theon. That's, that's not the construction. It's uh, There it uses the neuter uh, form prior to proston theon, which I already said, uh, isn't the same one that's used here. I made that point yeah. in my opening statement. Yeah, I mean, what John says is ain prostantheon, not ta, uh, ta uh, prostantheon. So you're confusing the construction. Here, what John does is he uh, uses pros with a stative verb, which has to refer to persons. It can never refer to anything other than a person. So do you have an example of that construction? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's an argument from silence. I think that's there's a lot of things we find in, in John's gospel. It's an, argument, so. it's an argument from Greek grammar. Okay, so you have no desperate. example of that. Yeah, that's okay. Do you, right. uh, it's, not, it's not desperate. It's called yeah. grammar and syntax, which is the name of the game. Uh, okay, so secondly, in uh, the, the second verse, John says, this one was in the beginning with God. Uh, that's a, a demonstrative masculine pronoun. In light of what John has just said, uh, is this uh, a reference to the word as a person or as a thing? John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1, 2. Uh, yeah, this the, one, the whole, the whole this, prologue up until we get to verse 14 is referring to the word the, the word of God similar to wisdom. Yeah. So as, as a non-person, but you're also assuming, by the way, that, the, that wisdom in Proverbs 8 is not a person that is just personified. You didn't give an argument for that, you just assumed it. But, but we're talking about John right now. In John, 
he uses the demonstrative pronoun right after saying ain cross tan theon, which is personal. Uh, he uses a, a masculine singular pronoun. Okay, let, let's move on. You don't have an answer for that one. Uh, in verse 3, John says, di au tu agoneta, all things through him became. He uses the masculine pronoun he. Uh, the, the dia here, through, with the genitive form of uh, he, the, the third person uh, singular, uh, means agency. So it's referring to a person. Right. It's not referring to an abstract thing. Right. Do you have a response to that? You just said agency. You yeah, said agency. Agent. Yeah. It's talking about a personal agent. So the word is the agent of creation, not a thing. It's, it's not God's mind. It's not in his head. This is something with God uh, that ha is the agent by which God creates everything. Yeah, an agent. An agent is not the person themselves. Um, uh, so it's other I, than God. Oh, how about this? It's other than God, right? It, it, not a person the same way wisdom is. It, you say, I'm, I'm assuming, but I gave you my view, so you should already know the answer to these questions about yeah, how I'm going to answer. You, you gave me your view minus the argument. You asserted that Proverbs 8 is personified wisdom. I don't grant that. But we're talking about John. In John 1, he's using personal pronouns. How about verse 10? Verse 10 says, uh, he was in the world, and the world through him became. Diao tu egoneta. Is that referring to a person? No. No? It, again, it uses the construction that means agency. Yeah. Uh, mean, but how about yeah. this? In verse 12, speaking of the same one, it says that people become children of God by believing in his name. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is this a person? No. No, that's not a person either, huh? No, I don't believe so. Uh, no. you, you don't believe so. So you uh, just, I mean, you like, when you go back to the Targums, people believed in the yeah. name of the Memra of Yahweh. They okay, certainly did, so. and, I, and I quoted the Targums. The Targums, Deuteronomy 4, uh, Targum Neophyte, Deuteronomy 26, Targum Neophyte, call the word of the Lord, the one who's seated on the throne, who is prayed to and answers prayers. So that's not going to help you. What about John's Gospel? Let's go back to John. In John's Gospel, it says that they believed in the name of the word. Why is this word being given a name? Why is faith in this name uh, saving? In fact, isn't that what the prologue says, or the, the, the thesis statement says about Jesus? How do we be, get eternal life and become children of God, according to you? Well, you're sort of mashing up. You're sort of mashing up things here. First of all, we're dealing. We'll deal with the prologue. Like I said, as a separate introductory summarization of about what's about to come. All right. So you're sort of mashing up ideas here, and you're not really you're not really understanding what's going on. I mean, if you want to ask a single question and ask uh, ask in a manner that you feel like you're not going to try and you really want to know something, I can answer it. But if you feel like you already know and you're just asking. Uh, just to yeah, ask, I do, to I do know, to and like, I want just... I want a refutation or something that even yeah. sounds like it instead yeah. of an assertion. But uh, okay, so you're saying that uh, taking the the prologue and the thesis statement is somehow relevant to each other is mashing them together because they both say that believing in the name of someone, uh, you know, but we can't make those two things go together. Okay, how about this? Can you tell me anything stated in the prologue about the word that isn't said about Jesus in the narrative? One thing. Yeah, but the thing is, you got to understand the poetics just, of everything. Just one. Uh, okay, I'm going to tell you, but here's the poetics of everything. you got to understand that the word is what came through Jesus. Jesus says, the logos that I have is not my own. They're rejecting the word that Jesus received from God. Jesus is the word made flesh. So, of course, poetically, John is going to say the same things that's happening to Jesus because the word of God was rejected prior to Jesus, and the word of God is not a person. Uh, well, no, you're, you're confusing things, first of all, when you say that Jesus said the words that I speak are not my own. First of all, there, the word logos is being used as an utterance. It's something people hear, but that's not your conception of the logos. You think uh, the logos is God's rationale, not a spoken utterance. If you thought it was a spoken utterance, then you have to ask, sir, how, how is this word heard by anyone in eternity? There's no one there to hear it in eternity if you're a Unitarian. But, but let's get back to the point. Jesus doesn't say in the narrative that, uh, you know, uh, this is something in him. For example, it says, uh, it says of the prologue, uh, in the prologue about the word, it says that uh, uh, in him was life and the life was the light of men. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Jesus, in the prologue, says, I am, or in the narrative, I am the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, uh, and so on and so forth. He's not simply saying there's something in me that has this life. I am the life. He uses the mm -hmm. personal pronoun. 
Yeah, again, again, that's the most shallow exegesis you could possibly perform. You're taking the shortest distance possible. But notice what Jesus also you have, says. You have a deep Jesus says that as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. So you got to understand, what is Jesus the way and the truth and the light to? What is he pointing to? The Father, just the same way the Word was said to be a lamp unto my feet. If you're missing the poetics, you're not going to understand. If you want to take the shortest route possible, you can stay believing what you want to leave, and that's okay. Okay, so you keep asserting that it's uh, poetry, but you haven't given the argument for that. But but let me ask you this. Let's suppose that, uh, uh, let's take your understanding that uh, this is just a personification in poetry and so forth. Uh, how then is the word called God in verse 1? Is God, a, person you. Is God I a personification? I told you in my in my opening. I, I what told did you, you tell in my... me. What did you tell me about God being a personification in your opening? Nothing. I didn't say God was a personification. Well, John one one says the word was God. So the word the was word, theos. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, if the word is if the word is not if God is not a personification yes. and the word was God, then okay. the word is not a personification. So here you have an extra biblical theory that you've produced that you're forcing on the text. You're saying you claim you know, but I have a Jewish. You say I don't know culture, but I'm talking about the foremost logos theorist that all the church fathers knew has a quote here. He said it is the true God that is meant by use of the article, the expression being I am the God. But when the word theos is used incorrectively, catechistically, which means an abuse of language, such as men might be called gods, figuratively, it is put without the article. And what he calls here God without the article, catechistically, is his most ancient word. Can you can you quote for me Philo saying that's true of the use of theos when it comes to being a pre-verbal predicate nominative? It Which is what's true in John 1 1? Hey, look, I mean, if that's if that's how you want to see things, you want to miss the deep substance. That's on you. Be it can't caught, be, be caught deep up in this, if, you, if you're, you're not nitpicking. You, you just—it's—it's—it's—it's it's, 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 it's like it's so utterly desperate. It's so utterly desperate. Here I have a cultural source from Philo explaining the exact same thing that people are arguing about forever from Philo, who makes pretty much in, uncoincidental numerous parallels with what we see in John's gospel and you want to just write it off and not even attempt to assess the the what's being said and I just told you why the Lagos is called Theos from a source can you do that you can't do that and you can't you can't uh, really you can't I just can. you can't just dismiss this clear evidence as if it doesn't it, exist and it, act like it's not saying the same thing that John 1 1 is saying. It's it's not clear evidence if it's not relevant to the construction found in John 1 1. John 1 1 is a unique oh. construction. It's a pre verbal predicate nominative use of theos. Mm. So it's uh, you have to either quote evidence, you can't keep calling it uh, deep or, or calling my responses shallow if you're not giving me any adequate response. Uh, how about, uh, y you know, it. it you don't have any reason for. Do you have any reason for saying this is a personification? I haven't heard any. Uh, this will, this will be the last question uh, from Anthony here. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, there's plenty. I mean, but again, this is just far beyond. This is far beyond the depth of this debate now. So if I mean, I, it's it's interesting here that it's you're not exactly like you're putting forth um, the argument that um, that the logos is not a personification or explaining what everybody understood that claimed that the logos was a personification, and then knocking it down. I mean, I, I I'm still dumbfounded after that. Somebody would believe that the Word of God is an actual being, given the evidence um, that we have. I do suggest that you go pick up C.H. Dodd's book on the fourth gospel, and he'll, he'll break everything down, show you why Lagos is a personification that comes um, from Philo. Maybe, exactly you can get, maybe you can get C.H. Dodd to debate me, and right. maybe he'll give me an answer. Yeah. All right, guys. All right, guys. All right, guys. Um, uh, Andrew, I, I normally let the first questioner sort of set the tone, and basically, whatever, whatever the uh, whatever the participants are comfortable with, uh, usually roll with that. Some some people do cross uh, cross examination only as one person just asking questions and the other person just answering. Anthony was clearly jumping in here and there and uh, explaining why he thinks you're wrong when leading into his next question. So the point of all that is, you can feel free to do the exact same. Um, so feel free to uh, make it a little conversational uh, if you'd like. All right, so guys, I'm going to get back off the screen, and then I will <clears throat> start the timer again when Andrew asks his first question. All right, so this first question might seem a little bit irrelevant to the debate, but I, but I promise that I'm just trying to understand where you're coming from as a Trinitarian. Uh, first, do you affirm the Nicene Creed? 
Yes. Okay, the Nicene Creed starts off by saying there is one God, the Father Almighty. Yes, it does. Right, okay. And then later it says that Jesus, but Jesus is God from God, correct? Right, of the essence of the Father is how it is. But, 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 but it does say, okay, right, but it says from yeah. God, Hom God Homo from God. Homo one right, right, later, right, later down, I, I get that it says it, but, it's, but it does say God from God, correct? Yeah, and it, okay. it explains that as of the essence yeah, of the Father. Yeah, I, I get that. I got you. Okay, I, trust me. I'm not gonna. I'm not really setting you up here. I'm just trying to understand and get your reasoning process so we can get to the main point. All right. So, all right. So, um, and it also says that Jesus was begotten before all ages. Yes, just like John seventeen five. How, how, how are you understanding begotten? It means that Jesus is of the essence of the Father. It's. Uh, you know, language that I already explained in my opening, where you, you said, I don't understand how the phrase son of God could mean that he's God. Well, like father, like son, that's the idea. He has the essence of his father. Right, no, uh, yeah, I, I so, get that. So, so, so begotten of the father is just a way of describing that relationship between the two. Uh, yeah. Jesus is of the father from all eternity, and that's why he can be called son. Yeah, but you see, here's the thing. One, John doesn't teach anything about essences, right? So you sort of have some extra biblical sure theorizing that you're... In... I, I already argued John 1-1 one, one is a qualitative use of theos. No, so he's yeah, saying that's that what you believe is... it is. That John doesn't explicitly the... teach it. Let's let's say that John doesn't explicitly teach that there's that's, a such thing as Greek... a substance. Okay, that's all I'm asking grammar. you is how do you define the word begotten? That's a simple... Uh, I need a definition. How do you define the word begotten? Yeah, I, so I would say that uh, the Son is eternally uh, generated of the Father. We can't think of this univocally as if it's the same thing uh, for God that we would say in terms of men. God is God. God is transcendent. Uh, so it's it's just a way of describing the relationship that obtains between the two, the fact that they share a common nature as all fathers and sons uh, share. Right, right. They share it once the Son is uh, brought forth. Once yes, the Son is begotten, then they share the same essence. I, I've described it as eternal generation or eternal begetting. Eternal meaning God, God, meaning what? The meaning that he was begotten before all ages? Yeah. So he was without, begotten, uh, so he was begotten sometime before time uh, as without, we know it began. Be, before before all ages means eternally. Okay. Biblically. So so at, at, um so at some point he was begotten. Oh, I wouldn't say point. There uh, you're, so you're still ever, assuming temporality. No, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, if we understand how uh, t time, time, how especially if we want to talk about how Jewish people understood time, time is essentially an illusion, right? Time began when God set time's, the star. Okay, I'm, I'm talking. Time's not an illusion according to the yeah. Bible. Okay, okay. Well, the thing is, time started when Timothy, God set the. Chose... Look, I gotta finish my question. Okay. Uh, time sorry. started according according how Jewish people understood their own Bible, right? Time started when God set the stars into motion. Right. And then so that time as we know as the as the sun, but time doesn't necessarily exist to God. Right. So here's the thing is what you're saying is that at some point before God created the universe, the sun was begotten. But you're saying uh, that, no, he always existed or was it infinitely generated is what you're really saying. Right. Not eternally, not not begotten at some point before time began, but he was infinitely just always was there. So then I guess my question would be, why is he called a son? If he was never brought into existence, why call him a son? Why would he be a son in whatever point you believe he was generated? Why would he be called son? Yeah, well, first of all, I reject your conception of time. Paul speaks of uh, God choosing people before the beginning of time. Time does have a beginning. Prior to that, we're talking about eternity. God's existence is super temporal. He doesn't experience succession. He's not a day older today. Uh, he doesn't have birthdays. So when we speak of God, anything happening prior to creation, it's eternal in the true and proper sense of the term. That's why Jesus not only defines himself as existing before coming into the world, but even describes his existence as eternal in John 8, 58, before Abraham became I am. He uses the uh, you know present form of that, indicating that his existence is eternal. So the beginning of the sun is not a temporal thing. It's not something that happened after something else. And if you want to say that he didn't become the son until some point, then you also have to say the father wasn't the father before some point. Because a, uh, the, the terms father and son are correlative. You can't have a father yeah. without a son or yeah, a son I'm without okay a father. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with yeah, that. You, you're okay with that, but Scripture speaks of God as uh, the Father as eternal. It's it's not just uh, something that comes into to existence at some point. 
Yeah, but speaking of the being and speaking as as his role of a father, but that's okay. Um, so so Jesus was begotten. How was the father and the son distinct? How how are they distinct? Do you, is it your belief that God duplicated himself? Uh, they're distinct in their personal subsistence. Each person says I. Each person exercises the divine will. So it's uh, God. God essentially duplicated himself. Are they different in any way? The, they're distinguishable, distinguishable in terms of their personal properties. The uh, begetting of the Son, the Father begat the Son, the Son is begotten, the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. That, that's the distinguishing personal property. They are numerically identical in terms of their essence, personally distinct in terms of their personhood. Something that John doesn't teach, but that's okay. Um, that's what you're asserting. So, so the, God, want, the Gospel of John, my second question, the, God, the Gospel of John says, Jesus says in the Gospel of John that the Father sent him over 40, about 41 times, right? So you, you said, again, John was sent, uh, Jesus was sent from heaven, right? He was sent from heaven. He wasn't a man, and then he was sent, as prophets were, right? Mm-hmm. John was sent from heaven. So can you Jesus. show me any instance in the Bible where someone being sent doesn't imply their subordination? Well, first of all, I don't reject Christ's willing subordination. The issue here is whether it was something that he entered into and agreed with the Father right. and the Spirit for the outworking of redemption. Okay, uh, I certainly that, I got agree you. that the Son was sent. That was my preliminary you, question. Remember I said I was going to ask some preliminary oh, okay. questions before my final question? All right, so okay. whose will was it? that the Son should come to the earth. Whose will was it? So you can't have, if Jesus already possessed the divine will, he wouldn't need to be sent. He would have just went. If the Father had the supreme divine will and it was the supremely intelligent being, he would have orchestrated event and had the subordinate Son sent. Right? So, so whose will was it that Jesus came to earth? The Father's or the Son's? Well, Jesus... I reject the assertions on which your argument is predicated. That uh, that whole that whole line there. Jesus was sent by the Father. I certainly grant that. It's stated at least forty three times in John's Gospel. In fact, it's a problem for you because you don't believe that he was actually sent from heaven, from above, as as the Bible says, as John says over and over. But uh, the the sending of the Son was not uh, something against the Son's will. As I said, prior to creation, Father, Son, and Spirit made an eternal covenant uh, about uh, redemption, uh, and, and this was part of the outworking. The Son had to submit to the Father for the sake of redeeming sinners who did not submit to the Father. Wow. So, of course, he submitted you know, to talk, the Father. Talk about extra-biblical cult revelation there, because I don't remember seeing a verse for that, but that's all right. So you you want to ask me for the verse? Here's the thing is, you can have one person who has the divine will and one person conform to that will. Jesus says, I did not come from heaven to do my will. So he's saying, the, the reason I came was not to do my own will, therefore the Father Father uh, possessed, solely possessed the divine will, me? and Jesus would have had to conform his will, showing he didn't have the same will, showing himself not to be God. Can you tell me which verse you're talking about here? What, where Jesus says, I came not to do my own will, but the will of the Father? Yeah. Yeah, so here's the thing. So you're going to say that Jesus came from heaven? Is that what I'm anticipating? Jesus ah. says, I came, I came not from heaven to do my own will. <laughs> right. So, I mean, are you are you arguing that the verse doesn't exist? John six thirty eight. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus didn't come to do his own will. So you're you're you so the, the idea that Jesus is God, but yet has a subordinate will that he conforms to somebody else shows his inferiority, showing that your argument of abstract Jesus property and deity that Jesus doesn't teach is bogus because that's why we examine the roles of each one and we see Jesus as subordinate throughout the whole gospel. And you have to you have to find little uh, enigmatic statements by Jesus, like I and the Father are one, assume what you believe and use it as a license to dismiss the entirety of what we read throughout the Bible. Talk about extra biblical cult revelation. Okay, I'll take that as a question. Uh, is it still time? Okay. So, first of all, I didn't appeal to John 10.30. Second, I don't think that's ambiguous. It needs to be ambiguous for you, because your beliefs are ultimately based on that revelation you received and rediscovered the truth uh, that the Christian Church had lost. But uh, the I already granted that Jesus was sent by the Father. You're assuming that this is something imposed upon him. It certainly wasn't. As the Eternal Son, God, the Word, John 1.1, 1, 1, God, the Only Begotten, John 1.18, my Lord and my God, John 20.28, 20, 
as the eternal God, this was necessarily something he com uh, complied with and entered into voluntarily. That's why Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, the authority to take it up again. Jesus uh, was not forced into the world. But thanks for admitting, by the way, that he did come from heaven, which uh, yeah. is contrary to your uh, Unitarian yeah, belief. He said he conformed to the Father's will, and then you're saying Willingly. That, but yeah, he willingly. willingly. So he chose to do it. That's uh, who would argue that. But who? But you're saying that he didn't have the will initially that he had to conform to a will that wasn't his own. That's All not right. what I said. All right, Anthony, go ahead and uh, respond That's to that. Implied. Go ahead and respond to that, Anthony. As the uh, as we'll, we'll call that the last question. Uh, we're we're over time, so go ahead and briefly respond if you want, and then uh, anything else save for the rebuttals. Yeah, no, I just said that he. That's not what I said. He put words in my mouth, so that there's nothing further that I'll add to that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, uh, we are finished with the uh, cross-examination, and we are going to move on to some rebuttals. I see lots of people posting questions, either for Anthony or for Andrew. Keep in mind, we have not gotten to the uh, Q&A. Both debaters have agreed to answer some questions at the end. So uh, save your questions uh, until the end, and you can get them ready if you want. If you Now, keep in mind, I don't know which side everyone is on i mean i, I know some of the regulars here and that, that they uh that they they they, they will most likely um, be favoring anthony but i also know other people showed up with uh with different views so uh in your questions once we get through the rebuttals and the conclusions then please uh, state who your question is for whether for anthony or for Andrew, and uh, keep it as brief as possible so that you can fit it in, uh, in uh, obviously, in the, in the chat. All right, so now we're going to turn to our second rebuttals. These are going to be shorter. These are just going to be five minutes. And so let me get uh, uh, Anthony up here. And Andrew, if you can um, silence your microphone once again, I'll get Anthony up by himself. And Anthony, I'll start your clock for five minutes whenever you start speaking. All right, so much of our discussion, or part of our discussion at least, has to do with the relevant background to John's Gospel. I have asserted that the Old Testament, first of all, is the inspired background, therefore the most relevant. And if we're going to ask about what Jews were believing, then we have to go to primary Jewish sources. Now, Andrew, strangely, said that uh, my sole claim here is based on Philo. I didn't bring up Philo. He brought up Philo. I simply quoted Philo to show he doesn't know what he's talking about. Philo did teach that the Logos is a person, which is not Andrew's position. But what I did quote are the Jewish Targums. In the Jewish Targums, the word, the Memra, the Logos, is identified as a person, and in fact a divine person, who's seated on the throne, who has all power, who answers prayers, and so on and so forth. As well, I also pointed out that the Old Testament itself teaches that the word is a divine person. Genesis 15, where the word of the Lord appears, the word of the Lord speaks. This is the background, if we're going to look for one, to John's Gospel. This is not personification, this is a full-blown person. That's why, uh, you know, I could easily quote scholars saying the same thing, but if words have any meaning, as Alfred Edersheim said, then the word is clearly a person. Uh, it's also clear from John's Gospel that the word that he's talking about is a person. That's why Andrew couldn't answer any of the linguistic points that I was making, any of the grammar, any of the syntax, because his position simply can't deal with the text itself. He says this is shallow. How is actually going to the grammar of the text shallow? Uh, that's not shallow. And by the way, uh, it's, uh, you can't say the words a person or a personification for a number of reasons. Number one, the word is called God. The word was God. God is not a personification. Uh, but as well, as I said already, uh, he didn't give any arguments for the word being a personification. He simply asserted that Proverbs 8 is a personification, but didn't give an argument for that. Uh, but notice, by the way, that the word, uh, it, what it says about the word in 1 1 is the same thing it says about Jesus in verse 18. It says the word was in the beginning, it was, the, the tense there indicates he already existed when everything began. The word was in the beginning, uh, so it's eternal, it uh, was eternal. Uh, the word was with God, so the word's a person. And thirdly, the word was God, divine by nature. That's the same thing said about Jesus in 118, a text he didn't even deal with, by the way, where it says, No man has seen God, meaning the Father, but God, the only begotten who's in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. Here it says that the word uh, was eternal. He's the being, ha'on. That's uh, the articular participle in Greek. Uh, it says he was with God in the bosom of the Father, and he was God, God the only begotten. 
I also pointed to John 20, 28. Here he had no answer to that, except to say Domitian, 20 years later, uh, calls himself a god, as if the Roman context explains uh, why a, a Jew, Thomas, would be calling Jesus my Lord and my God. Uh, he says... Uh, uh, you know, that uh, even the demons said the Messiah is the Son of God. I don't know how that helps him. How do, how do the demons immediately recognize Jesus and then throw themselves at his feet and call him the Son of God? Apparently, they recognize this person. How would they recognize him? Because Jesus came from heaven. Uh, Andrew seems to think this isn't significant, but of course it's significant for our debate. Uh, that Jesus came from heaven. Andrew thinks Jesus is only a man. He didn't exist before his conception. But when John speaks of Jesus coming from heaven, uh, notice that in John's mind, uh, I mean, this really means from heaven. He speaks of Jesus descending eight times. Uh, he speaks of Jesus coming uh, at least 11 times. Uh, he speaks of, uh, in fact, in uh, John 6:62, it says, Jesus says, What then if you shall see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? So he existed before he came into the world. Moreover, that existence is eternal. In John 8, 58, Jesus said, Before Abraham became, I am. He contrasts his eternal existence with the becoming or coming into being of Abraham. He does the same thing in John 17, 5. Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world became. By the way, notice that this is an imperative in the Greek. Jesus issues an imperative to the Father. Father, glorify me. But according to Andrew, Jesus shouldn't be able to do this. Only the Father can command Jesus. But here's Jesus imperatively saying, glorify me. So over and over again, John's Gospel teaches the deity of Christ, and it teaches it in terms of his sonship, by the way. I pointed that out in John 5.18, in John chapter 10, numerous other examples where the Jews understood his claim to be doing things uh, together with the Father, coextensively, everything the Father does, as a claim of equality with God, John 5.18. They also said it was blasphemy in John chapter 10 because he was making himself out to be God. This is the same charge they make at his trial in John 19, that he was claiming to be God and therefore was a blasphemer. Thank you, Anthony. And uh, Anthony, if you could silence your... Silence your mic now, and Andrew, if you can make sure to turn your mic back on, I will get Andrew back up on the screen by himself, and you have five minutes. I will start the timer whenever you start speaking, Andrew. All right, so first, um, regarding, uh, as a Unitarian, I feel obligated to argue against the idea that Jesus pre-existed at all, right? But Jesus... The assumption is because Jesus pre-existed, that, that means he's God, but we know that's not true, right? Angels pre-existed humans. They've been around for a long time, right? So Jesus coming from heaven wouldn't even mean he's God. Even if you were to take that literal, which I don't, because Jesus says, unless you are born from above, unless you are born from above. But again, if we want to miss the language and we don't want to see what, what it says about ascending, he who has penetrated the heavenly mysteries, how that's historically known. If you don't if you don't want to understand that cultural context, these things are sounding like desperate babble. That's OK. I got an abundance of information that's that's going to come out. So don't worry about that. But here's the thing. So he says, well, where Jesus was before. Right. Let's say that's literal and that's true. Right. Jesus says, where where did Jesus go? Upon resurrection to the father's side, subordinate to the God. So uh, subordinate to God. And so if Jesus returned to the glory which he had, it's still in a position subordinate to the father. So that's that's a strange argument. It doesn't prove your point. And I think it still misses the point. It's talking about a future glorification that Jesus received because he says, now, father, the time has come. Glorify your son with the glory that what that he had predestined. Now, I understand what the language says there, but is the glory which God predestined for him. As Anthony said, God foreordained a lot of things to happen before time began. So Jesus was chosen to be the Messiah. Paul goes on to say that disciples of Christ were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. So in the Jewish mindset, idea of preexistence, things that existed in the mind of God that he foreordained had concrete reality. Number two, uh, this is not that big a deal. And Anthony's in the minority, far minority of, for, about the dating of John. But that's not even crucial to my debate, as I uh, to my to my argument, because as I pointed out, it was common for all 
emperors at that time to, to bear the title God and son of God and things like this without confusing them and even humans called God without confusing them. And again, referring to the Lagos, a separate introductory piece, I've already brought something from the Jewish philosopher who talked, who was the foremost Lagos theorist, Philo of Alexandria. All right. But again, let's get into the memra. So so he wants to talk about the memra. All right. I'm going to I suggest I got two books that I that I um, that I um, suggest and highly encourage you to check out. Number one is a critical introduction to the Targums by Bruce Chilton. Right. Number two is Philo Foundations of Religious Philosophy in Judaism, Christianity and Islam by H.A. Wolfson. Page 287. As for the memra of the Targum. No scholar nowadays will entertain the view that it is either a real being or an intermediary. So you're in the minority there. You're dipping off into extra biblical cult territory. All right. So so what does the memory even means? What? It means the word, decree, command, or speech. That's one person giving a word, decree, command, or speech. There's three different terms that refer to different manifestations of the one God in the Targums, namely Memra, Shekinah, and Yakara. Memra, meaning the word of God. Shekinah, meaning the presence of God. And Yakara, meaning the glory of God, the weightiness, opinion of God. Right? Um, these are all manifestations of the one true God. As Wolfson points out, as for the memory of the Targum, no scholar nowadays will entertain the view that it is either a a real being or an intermediary these are buffer words which maintain god's transcendence that's 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 widely noted by scholars it, it things like the name of god or manifestations which took on people began to think there's actual angels right he says god help me by your name and save me by your power this is a manifestation of god proverbs 18 10 the name of yahweh is a strong tower the righteous man runs into it in the safe second chronicles 7 16 for i have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy a place where my name will be honored forever these are all buffer words which maintains god's transcendence again when you get into how these two powers, how this stuff even came about. This is admitted by Alan Siegel in his book. This is all bad exegesis. This is all poor exegesis based on passages like the Son of Man. People thought that the Son of Man, this is talking about a future vision. This being didn't exist at the time. He wasn't being given a kingdom at the time Daniel had his vision. This is about the exalted and risen and exalted Lord Jesus who has given a kingdom, a, ki a kingdom that he said that he will later give back to his father and be subordinate to his father. All right, so that's... So so the idea that the memory, this is just shallow. And I, I'm just saying, I just encourage you and everyone to really search these things out because here is a, a moment where Trinitarians, I feel like went 500 miles in the wrong direction and forgot to stop with these elementary building blocks of understanding. And that's the cultural um, reference of the second temple. All right, thank here. you. Thank you, Andrew. And once again, Andrew, if you could... Uh, mute your mic, and Anthony, if you could turn yours on. Ladies and gentlemen, we are entering our final rebuttals. These will be uh, five minutes each, and then we will have our conclusions followed by some Q&A from the audience. Uh, little side note, I see DCCI uh, in the chat. DCCI, uh, keep... Uh, we've been planning for a couple of years to have uh, a tune on, and uh, please contact me. I, I know things have gotten buried in the past, but... Uh, Definitely want to get Hatun on, and, and uh, this week, this week could be good. All right, so, Anthony, let me get you back on. Um, uh, right, we have Anthony on, and Anthony, this is your final rebuttal before your conclusion, and I'll start the timer when you start. Okay, notice we still have no answer to John identifying Jesus as God in John 1.1, 1, 1, in John 1.18, and John 20.28. 20, He's made assertions about John 1.1, 1, 1, but no actual argument. He didn't say anything about John calling Jesus God in John 1.18, so there's no answer there. And as far as John 20.28, 20, here he tried to repeat or bring smuggle back in his bad appeal to Roman uh, culture at this point, as if Thomas, a Jew, is somehow uh, referring to Jesus as God the way pagans would. I pointed out earlier that a Andrew's pagan conception of the Logos is pagan. It's derived from pagans, not from Jewish sources. Uh, so 
uh, again, we have him appealing to non-Jewish sources to explain the Bible. This is not a good exegesis. Now, his recent desperate attempt to salvage the idea that the word is impersonal is just bad, plain bad. Notice that he asserts that Philo, for example, didn't believe the word was a person. And then, to prove it, he doesn't quote Philo, he quotes some other scholar. Uh, however, I actually went to the primary source. I quoted scholar, I mean, I quoted Philo to actually prove that he believed the word uh, is a person. He calls him God's chief messenger, uh, higher than the angels, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I quoted primary sources. He also mentioned Alan Siegel. Go pick up Alan Siegel's book, uh, Two Powers in Heaven. Alan Siegel will tell you that Philo, as a scholar, since we're appealing to secondary sources, a scholar will tell you that Philo believed the word was a person. Uh, and, and the same thing goes for the Memra. I quoted primary sources, Targum Neophyti on Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 26. I could easily cite other Targums, Targum Suda Jonathan. They all teach that the word was a divine person. The word is prayed to, the word seated on the throne. Andrew, uh, in fact, if we want to quote scholars, he said, no scholar teaches that the memory is a, a person. Here's Daniel Boyerin in the Harvard Theological Review. He said, the strongest reading of the memory is that it is not a mere name. That's what Andrew said. Uh, it's not a mere name, but an actual divine entity. Uh, and, and by the way, Daniel Boyerin is an Orthodox Jewish scholar. He says this was the original view of Jews prior to the post-Christian apostate Talmudic rabbis. Uh, so, uh, again, Andrew's position simply isn't biblical. It's also not uh, doing good history. Uh, a Andrew said it's irrelevant if Jesus is preexistent. Well, first of all, it's, it's not irrelevant because it, it comports with my view that Jesus is God. If Jesus is God, we would expect it to say that. But he's right in saying that mere preexistence wouldn't prove uh, that Jesus is God because other things preexisted too. However, notice that's not all that I said. I said Jesus eternally preexisted. I pointed to John 8, 58, John 17, 5. And here he didn't appeal, to, uh, he didn't respond to John 8, 58 on that. He did try to butcher John 17, 5 by saying that the Father predestined Jesus before the world became, but that's not what Jesus says in John 17, 5. He says, Father, glorify me with yourself, here John 1, 1, with yourself before the world became, before the world became. He also gave this in uh, incredibly bad response to Jesus talking about ascending into heaven. Uh, he said, because in John 3, it says that people have to be born from above, as if that's the same thing as Jesus saying he descended from heaven and was ascending into heaven. In fact, in the same context, Jesus makes it clear that this, uh, this just won't wash. In, in 331, this is what Jesus says. Uh, this is actually John the Baptist talking about himself in relation to Jesus. He said, he who comes from above is above all, above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. So here's John the Baptist, surely somebody who's been born from above, but he contrasts himself with Jesus saying he's from the earth, Jesus is from heaven, Jesus is above all. So Andrew's interpretation doesn't work there either. Uh, over and over again, Andrew's answers simply just don't do justice to the text. The text very clearly teaches that Jesus is Son of God in a transcendent sense, and this is what a person must believe for eternal life. Anybody who doesn't confess this sense of Christ's sonship, a sense that is fully consistent with Thomas's confession, my Lord and my God, understood in a consistently and thoroughly, faithfully Jewish sense, Anybody who doesn't confess that does not have eternal life. And that's why, ultimately, what's back of their interpretations, what's driving it, is not the text of Scripture, which they have to keep avoiding. Uh, it's it's a, rather got to be some kind of new revelation, a, uh, a discovery of what the church has lost all these ages, just like Muhammad said, just like Joseph Smith said, just like Charles Taste Russell said, just like the Campbellites said. All these groups had the same kind of idea. They were restoring true Christianity. But just like Andrew, they all had to ignore the text or what they didn't like in the text. Thank you, Anthony, for your final rebuttal. And now we will have Andrew's final rebuttal. Let me get my uh, timer reset here. And let me get Anthony, uh, Andrew up on the screen. All right, Andrew, uh, Anthony, if you could silence your mic if you haven't already. Andrew, if you could make sure yours is on. And five minutes whenever you're ready. All right. All right. So here's the thing. I don't know why we keep going over this. I don't know why I have to keep going over this. Uh, 
Um, that that I have no answer, no argument for John one one. I put forth evidence, and then so getting the next point, he says no Jewish sources. These are just pagans that he's quoting. I don't know how much more Jewish it gets than Philo of Alexandria. I just really don't. He's a perfect representation of that time. And you can laugh, but this is history. That's fine. And then and secondly, he wants to go on and and and, and say, uh, not even notice what he's quoting from Philo about the Logos. The Logos is what? His chief messenger? Well, where did the message come from? He's the chief messenger. If you can't be the chief, if you're among yourself, He's the chief. You, if you don't understand Philo's philosophy, that's not really my thing. So here's the, so here's the thing. You want to talk about uh, Trinitarians love Daniel Boyeron because he's probably the only one who even might even come close to agreeing with what they say. But he doesn't. He writes this article called Logos, a Jewish word, John's prologue as Midrash, right? In the annotated um, New Testament, Jewish New Testament, he says, for Jews, the idea of this link between heaven and earth, whether called the Greek Lagos or Sophia, or by the Aramaic Memra. So here he's already equating. So there's your guy saying that equating the two together, whether it's called this or whether it's called that or whether it's called this, whatever it is, permeated first and second century Jewish thought. Right. He goes on to say that Philo, writing in first century uh, Alexandria for an audience of Jews devoted to the Bible, used the idea of Lagos as if it were commonplace. His writing make uh, uh, make apparent that at least for some pre-Christian Judaism, there was nothing strange about a doctrine of a manifestation of God, even as a second God. The Lagos didn't conflict his monotheism. Right. A second God. So, again, you, you want to butcher it. Then you, you, you invited yourself into that one. I, I tried to give you an out and, and explain it to you. You could have just accepted it. But now now you got yourself in a pickle. You know, uh, Philo says that. What does he say about the Lagos? Neither being uncreated as God was nor created as you, but being in the midst of these two extremities. Right. If he's brought forth by God. And at some point he was brought up. And if you don't understand that the Lagos was called the firstborn son of God, what was called the youngest born of God by Philo? Creation. First, God made the blueprint through which he made the created universe. If you don't want to understand that philosophically, I tried to explain it to you. I tried to be nice. And now you got yourself in a pickle. Because you want to talk about what Philo says as bad news for Trinitarians. And I'm just going to tell you, I would just keep his name far away from your theology because it's bad news. I would just forget that this conversation happens. Maybe David can just delete this off the Internet because this is bad news for Trinitarian theology. And this is the beginning of the end. I can assure you that. All right. So, um I don't really know what else to say. I got three principles that I, that I went into this debate and that I can help anybody deal with Trinitarian theology. One principle, an enigmatic statement, especially in John, is not a license to dismiss anything we've read so far. You can't read I and the Father are one and dismiss everything that Jesus says about himself or the context in Ezekiel 34. All right. Trinitarians take the shortest route possible. They say, uh uh, make way for the Lord, and then Jesus came, psh, Jesus is God. That's the most shallow and, uh, and shortest route you can possibly take, and it leads to terrible conclusion. And number one, John doesn't teach it, right? If John doesn't teach it, right, you then you're, that means you're assuming it and reading it into the text, right? You might say, well, you know, that, that John, uh, well, you know, you're assuming Philo's teaching and reading it into the text, right? You might say that, but here's the thing, is this is an ancient source talking about the Lagos, describing the exact same thing we're reading in John 1 from around the time. This is not an extra biblical creed dogma that it took people 400 years to develop on paper. All right. So John doesn't teach this, not even within the realm of cultural context for John. If you want to talk about the Lagos and believe it's a second person, I don't believe it is. I think the argument based down to here is the takeaway from this is that we got to ask ourselves, is wisdom a personification of a manifestation, as Boyerin says, at least in his article here, right? Or is wisdom an actual person alongside God? 
That's what we have to ask ourselves. And then if you believe that wisdom is an actual person, you have to describe how this person is alongside, said to have been brought forth by God and, and used by God as well. All right. Thank you, Andrew, for your final for your final rebuttal. And everyone, we will be moving into our uh, conclusions now. These will be five minute conclusions and we'll follow that uh, with some Q&A from the chat. So everyone get your questions ready. And uh, again, <clears throat> you'll want to state who, uh, who the question is directed towards. Um, also, by the way, side note, it, it, it's, it's perfectly acceptable if you have a question that would apply to both people, just say for, for, for both, uh, both debaters and then, and then ask your question. All right, now we are moving into the conclusion for each side. Let me get Anthony up on the screen. And Anthony, you have five minutes to conclude. All right, we still have no response from Andrew to Jesus defining himself as Son of God, the thesis of John's Gospel. In John 5.18, a text that hasn't been touched, Jesus' uh, claim of sonship is understood as a claim of equality with God because he was claiming that his works were coextensive with those of the Father throughout the past up until the present. The same thing in John chapter 10 when they say that it's, uh, he's guilty of blasphemy for claiming to be the Son of God. This is the thesis of John's Gospel. This is what it means to actually interpret things in context, to in interpret it in light of its actual thesis, the one that John painstakingly uh, explains over and over again. We also had no response to John 1.1's description of the Word as God, as with God, as eternally with God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. That's not a personification for all the reasons I gave. First of all, Andrew didn't give an argument for it being a personification. Second, you don't call God a personification, but the Word is called God. Third, that's just not how the Greek grammar works. It's clearly talking about a person. Ain Prostantheon always talks about persons uh, being with God, never of an abstraction. In fact, if you want to say the word's an abstraction, just God's rationale, it would be internal to God, and there'd be an easy way to say this. John 1.4 says, in him was life, meaning in the word. Here you have the kind of construction John would have to use if he wanted to say the word was just God's rationale in him. Uh, so we've got no answer that proves that uh, the word is simply a personification. And this is why Andrew wants to, you know, keep going back to Philo. But he says, Philo doesn't help me. Notice, I'm not appealing to Philo to interpret John. I'm saying Philo doesn't help him. He brought up Philo in this debate. I pointed out that Philo thinks of the Logos as a person. I quoted Lo uh, Philo to this effect. Instead of fo quoting Philo, he quoted some secondary source about Philo. But Philo calls the Logos God's firstborn son. You even heard Andrew say that. He also butchered, by the way, Andrew, or uh, excuse me, uh, Daniel Boyerin's position. Uh, by uh, you notice that when he quoted Boyerin, Boyerin says the memra is a manifestation of God. But then when he interpreted Boyerin, he said he's a personification of a manifestation. That is not what Boyerin says. I already quoted Boyerin very clearly saying that the memra is a divine entity in the Targums. I could easily quote him saying the same thing. Uh, for, notice here, for example, same article, uh, the beginning of Trinitarian reflection, he says, was precisely in non-Christian Jewish accounts about the second visible God, variously called the Logos, Wisdom, or Son of God. So Boyerin does not teach that the memory was simply a personification. Andrew's not reading secondary sources any better than he's reading primary sources, because he's not even quoting them. Uh, and he's not reading John, uh, certainly, uh, any better than he's reading any of them. And that's because what's ultimately driving Andrew's understanding is a pre-commitment to Unitarianism that he got by a revelation uh, and, and led him to believe that he has rediscovered the truth that Christians have been uh, missing uh, for 2,000 years. Uh, that simply isn't uh, the case. It doesn't cut it. Uh, let me just cut, touch a couple of things that I didn't uh, address earlier. One thing is Andrew's claim that Jesus is a shepherd in John 10 in no higher sense than what he found in John, or excuse me, Ezekiel 34. He says Trinitarians take the shortest route possible. Well, here's the route that we take. When you look at John 10 and Jesus calling himself the shepherd, he speaks of calling people by the power of his voice. It's his voice that draws them to him. Second, he says he gives them eternal life. Third, he says that nobody can snatch them out of his hand. All of these are divine claims. They presuppose divine works, divine authority. In fact, he even uses the exact same language as Yahweh in the Old Testament. 
In Deuteronomy 32, 39, God says, no one can snatch them out of my hand. That's what Jesus said in defining himself as the shepherd of the sheep. It's in this context that Jesus goes on to say, I and the Father are one, a passage that Andrew has to say is ambiguous. It's not ambiguous, it's just all too clear for Unitarianism, especially if you've got a non-biblical revelation that tells you to believe something differently. Uh, over and over again, Scripture teaches the deity of Christ and and. I don't think there's any question here that Andrew has not been able to deal with the text. He hasn't been able, and, he, and there's some text that he hasn't even tried to deal with. I haven't expected, really, Andrew, for you to deal with every single thing that I've said. It's really uh, too much to ask of anyone. But I did expect you to answer the text that I specifically uh, uh, emphasized and kept bringing up each rebuttal, and, and you didn't do that. You didn't deal adequately with John 1.1. Uh, you didn't deal with John 1.18, you didn't adequately deal with John 20.28, 20, although you did say, uh, again, uh, you know, I'm in the minority, for example, because I believe it was written be uh, before AD 70. Well, John 5, 1 and 2 says that John was writing before AD 70, uh, so I, I guess I'm in a good minority. Anyways, time's up. All right. Thank you for that conclusion, Anthony. And we will have, um, we will have... Andrew's conclusion here. Just let me reset my let me reset my timer. And Andrew, you have five minutes for your conclusion. Anthony, please be sure to turn off your mic. Andrew, please be sure to turn yours back on. And five minutes whenever you're ready. All right. Very very interesting here. All right. So I'm going to jump into a few things here. One one is the idea that that uh why jesus was called son of god and we'll even tie that in to um being born from above and, and seeing what that looks like okay so i mean i guess i don't know if according to anthony philo is a pagan but i think he's pretty jewish i would find him to be pretty jewish right what does he say about my uh, about moses moses experienced a second birth better than the first what is john talking about there in john 3 what is he talking about being born again? He the 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 um the um the uh, Nicodemus comes to him right in, in the night and says that I know that you're the son of God. What does Jesus jump right into about being born from above? He's trying to tell you how he does it. Um, but another point that you're gonna miss, but that's okay. And he talks about Philo talks about Moses experienced a second birth better than the first, and he says, but he had no mother only a father who is the father of all. Jesus, Moses was called the son of God, right? Because he had only a father and no mother because he was born again from above. But that's okay. I don't know what, uh, you know, I, 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 I but if, if Philo's not Jewish enough to you, you know, then, then nothing I'm saying is, is really going to make sense. And again, in John 8, so he talks about, well, the Jews picked up stones to, to stone him because he was saying he was the son of God. The same Jews in John 8 who Jesus says, why don't you understand anything that I'm saying? You're trying to murder me because you don't understand what I'm saying. So the Jews trying to murder him is because they don't understand him. So Anthony's position, I guess, would say that the Jews actually did understand him. All right. So again, he talks about, yes, I do. I did. I, I'm not sure that I said Boyerin said that, that that the Logos was a personification of a manifestation, but if we're talking about a manifestation, then then if we're talking about Lo, uh, Sophia being a manifestation, then we're talking about a personification, not an actual person, um, unless you want to get around that. Again, they called it a second god, but and Philo calls the Logos a second god one time, and, and Philo's uh, whole, um, again, um, if you want to get in and he says that I quoted extra biblical or, 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 or scholars that deal with Philo. What does Philo said? I, I quoted this earlier. It is manifest also that the archetypal seal, which we call the world that is perceptible to the intellect, must itself be the archetypal model, the idea of ideas, the logos of God. How is the ideas of an of ideas a person? So you, you can't take one thing. I'm just telling you, you can't take one thing that Philo says and think that you have a clear understanding of what he says. Well, Philo says it's a person here, but here he calls it the ideas of ideas. Right. And he says, but the seal is an idea of ideas according to which what according to which the ideas that God produced as a blueprint and that he fashioned the world with comprehensible only to the intellect, only by understanding the pattern 
of in creation and how God wants to manifest his plans can we understand God no one the word of God is what makes God known because no one at any time has ever seen God all right so 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 there again I'm talking I'm telling you directly from Philo I'm telling that you can't take one thing from Philo and that's just bad news we can pretend this never happened I won't bring it up maybe uh, you can see if you can hack into YouTube and take this off the internet but it, I would I would just say well just let it be and maybe nobody will see it because I think it's just bad news for Trinitarianism um, so he talks about uh, oh, hearing the voice of God again it's completely shallow right again he said well the, God says the voice here and Jesus says the voice here Jesus is God that's the shortest route possible you could possibly take what are they hearing from his voice he says that it gives them eternal life what is, what does um let's see John uh, John 668 6, Simon Peter replied Lord to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. You can't be both God and of God. You render language useless to be of something means you're not that which you are of, right? So he has the words of life. But if you don't follow the patterns and you just want to see voice and voice, take the shallowest route and there's, use it as a license to dismiss everything that's else is that said about Jesus, you're going to end up with a view that's Trinitarianism. My thing is not based off some cult revelation. I'm not telling you you get a planet of your own right when you die that's not what i'm saying i'm talking about straight from the bible and cultural context and if and if, if you want to try to and and so all my information that i presented here today was straight from the bible and cultural context right you want to say i, cl I claim pagans and uh regardless so uh talking about i i think that it's extremely shallow to date it's not really that relevant um but it, so you want to date the gospel of john because he speaks as if the temple still existed. That's your evidence. You want to go against all of scholarship to say that? I think that's, again, extremely weak and goes against the consensus of scholarship. All uh, right, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our debate. Well, to the Q&A. That ends the formal portion of our debate. We're now going to have some Q&A. We're not going to go too long with this. Uh, We've already been going two hours now, and uh, some people's brain just turned to mush after two hours. Uh, so we'll take about 20 minutes or so, 15 to 20 minutes for some questions. And now is the time to post your questions. I will begin. I'm going to scroll down. Uh, so again, if you've been posting questions all along, uh, no problem. But now uh, you want to repost them. Because some people are saying, go up above and find my question. I, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going up above and finding your question. So post your questions now, and I'll start probably start with a question for Anthony. So if you have a question for Anthony. Um, let's see. And by the way, Anthony uh, and Andrew, if you, want, if you guys want to look at the questions and, and sort of uh, uh, pick your own questions, you can do that too because that'll go more smoothly. I could be looking at questions while you guys are answering something, and then you could be looking up questions while the other person is answering and so on. Um, okay, Devin here. Let me get down to Devin. Uh, I saw Devin just posted a question directed towards Anthony. Um, oh, why am I too far back up? Oh, one second. All right, they're coming too fast now. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. Oh, oh and by the way, side note, uh, I will give preference to questions that are actually specifically related to the topic. So if they're on the topic of uh, whether Jesus is God in the Gospel of John, I'll, I'll give preference towards that. Other than that, um, if I don't see questions based on that, I'll give uh, preference to questions that are on the uh, broader topic of Trinitarianism and Unitarianism. And apart from those, I, I, I won't be taking questions. All right. So Devin here says... Question for Anthony. Please ask Anthony to explain John chapter 20, verse 17, and why our God is the Father only and not Jesus or the Trinity. Do we not share the same God as Jesus? Yeah, so first of all, it doesn't say that the Father alone, or only is God there. Uh, Jesus says, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Now, I already anticipated this, or at least uh, believe that I did. Uh, you know, Andrew can try and, you know, chime in here. But uh, uh, I pointed out that the Word became flesh in John 1.14. According to uh, Jeremiah 32, the God is the God of all flesh. In becoming flesh, the Father becomes his God. 
So Jesus is one person with two natures. His divine nature is one with the Father. In terms of his human nature, he's one with us. He's like us in his humanity. Uh, so, and by the way, Andrew's reasoning when he says if he's of something, he can't be it, doesn't make any sense. You know, he's the Holy One of God, he can't be God. But Jesus is called the Son of Man. Does that mean he can't be a man? No, it means precisely that he's a man. And this is the explanation then to John 21, 17. Since he is a man, the Father is necessarily his God. But don't miss that this is the same context where Jesus is called my Lord and my God in 2028. You can't pit these two things against each other. You can't arbitrarily uh, accept one and reject the other. And you can't explain it away by turning Thomas into a Roman pagan who thought Jesus was a god in the same sense that one of the Roman emperors claimed to be god. That's never attested in the Bible at all. My god always for a Jew meant Yahweh. Never uh, a pagan god like Domitian. Jesus is not a pagan god like Domitian. All right. Uh, this is a question for both, but it's short, and then we'll have a question for uh, for Andrew. Uh, to both, is it better to read and listen to what the Messiah says, teachings and parables, and try to live that way, or do we have to watch guys like you and try to learn all your big words? <laughs> so, is this is this uh, you know uh, simple and believe Jesus' message and and follow his his life and teachings, or? Is there a good reason to uh, learn the stuff you guys are uh, studying? You can each just give a quick response uh, so, because that's not. So I'll, I'll, I'll quickly say, since unlike Andrew, I don't believe the Bible is ambiguous or that we have to appeal to a pagan Roman cultural context to explain it. I would tell you, go read the words of Jesus. You don't need me. I, that, that's the last thing I want anyone to think. Read the Gospel of John. Tell me if you'd ever, in your wildest imagination, come up with a Jesus who isn't God, according to John's Gospel. It's just not the sort of thing that people naturally come up with. Uh, and in fact, Andrew admitted that at the beginning of the debate. This is the place that everybody goes to to prove that Jesus is God. It's not a place that you'd expect a Unitarian to go. So... Uh, you know, I, I would tell you, go read John's gospel. You don't need to listen to me. You don't need to listen to Andrew. Anthony, this was a nice, lighthearted question, and you had to turn it into into an attack. Hey, All right, go. <laughs> let me just let me just say, I, I, I do, uh, I, I appreciated when Andrew was being feisty. I thought there okay. were a couple times there he did a he did a really good uh, job there with that. I, you know, I hope he likes mixing it up like that too because i i appreciate it okay uh andrew same question uh basically on the significance of you know i, I guess studying the you know learning the greek grammar and, and things like that and then I'll, I'll have a, a separate question for you yeah first i say um yeah i do appreciate i do appreciate uh you know the um resistance it always um you know either refines i can either take what stays or what goes will go so i appreciate having my uh, views pressured and i think everybody should uh, question their views like descartes says at least once in their life right uh, so i think it's interesting because as a unitarian as as someone who 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 has the beliefs i do and was ultimately rejected by these people that i thought loved me unconditionally from my the church i left uh, unitarians are um often told that when we're, we're children of the devil and anthony didn't say that but i've I've been told that before or that we're not Christians, right? But what makes a Christian is our behavior and our lifestyle. If I'm not a Christian because I say Jesus has a God and Jesus is saying he has a God, then I, I'm sure God can overlook that if there's something that I'm getting wrong. Um, so ultimately, yes, at the end of the day, um, we should be conforming our behavior to the, um, to the will of God. At the same time, we can engage in these, uh, you, you can either take or leave these conversations because we go in and we refine, and it actually, I, I believe, expounds and expands our understanding of God. And so that's a great thing. All right, now question for Andrew from uh, Luke L007. Um, Romans 125 forbids worship of creation. If Jesus is our Savior and not God, it would follow that any worship of him would be paganism. So I'm um, guessing that's a, a question on whether you agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, it, it's a fair question. You know, it seems like the guy's sort of going through the reasoning process. He's like, well, I mean, I don't know why he's asking. Maybe he wants to worship Jesus, but he doesn't can't do it just because he believes Jesus is 
a creature, right? But as I brought up in First Chronicles 9, uh, 29, 20, perfect example. Then David said to the whole assembly, praise Yahweh, your God. So the whole assembly praised Yahweh, the God of their fathers. They bowed down and paid homage to Yahweh and to the king. So they're bowing down. They're prostrating themselves. Men were prostrated um, before all throughout the Bible. The idea that that um, that, that uh, creatures worship. You know, these guys like to bring l the word "latreu" and talk about, well, this is a specific kind of worship. That's a bogus argument. Um, but you know, here we have First Chronicles twenty nine twenty. It says they bowed down and paid homage. That's worshiping Yahweh and the King. King is not God. So I would say we worship Jesus in the same sense and we pay homage to him in the same sense that people did to Yahweh and his Messiah in First Chronicles 29, 20. All uh, right. This also is a question for both. And Andrew, you can start and then uh, Anthony uh, can answer the same question. And then we'll go back to Anthony for a question. Um, the Ode Ode Kid uh, says a uh, question for Andrew and Anthony. The man in Genesis 32, 22 to 32 is known as Jehovah and then is known as the angel in Hosea 12, 2 through 5, who wrestled with Jacob. So doesn't this mean that angel is God? Uh, no. And I'll tell you why. I mean, given the, the, the criterion for these intermediary figures, one of the things is if they possess the divine name of God, if this is an authorized person speaking for God, for instance, in the burning bush, right? People like to say the angel of the Lord as if it's only one person, right? But, but I believe it's in the book of Acts, it says that an angel an angel. There was many figures called the angel of the Lord, including humans. So this person is unique. He's special among the angels, but he's still speaking and representing God. And it switches back and forth. And sometimes the identities are mixed there. But um, uh, I guess the, the question is, is, does that mean this person is a God? No, because this person is said explicitly to be an angel. If you're an angel, you're a messenger. And if you're a messenger, you received a word from somewhere. That's from the supremely intelligent, supremely powerful being who both gave the word and commissioned and empowered the agent to bring forth his word. All right, Anthony, same question. Uh Okay, yeah, completely wrong on Andrew's part. We should expect the same thing uh, when it comes to him dealing with the Old Testament as what we saw when he was trying to deal with the, the New Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, the construction that's used there for the angel of the Lord doesn't mean an angel. The, the construction is Melach Yahweh. Since it's in construct relationship with the name of God, it's a definite construction. It doesn't mean an angel. It means the angel or the messenger. The word messenger is a functional term, not ontological. It's not referring to his nature. It's simply referring to what he does. When we, uh, the way we know who this messenger is, is by how he's referred to. Moses calls that messenger Yahweh in uh, Genesis 16, 14. Specifically, with respect to the event in Genesis 32, when the angel wrestled uh, with Jacob, listen to what the prophet Hosea explicitly says. He says, uh, uh, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us. Even Yahweh, the God of hosts, Yahweh is his memorial name. Here, the prophet Hosea explicitly identifies the one who wrestled with Jacob as Yahweh, the God of hosts. So he doesn't just call him God, he calls him Yahweh, the special covenant name of God. The same thing Moses called him in 1614, as well as in numerous other passages. All right. hey, well, let me, let, can I clarify, and, though? Uh, Is that all right? I'll give you right. I'll give you I'll give you 30 seconds, but then Anthony gets a 30 second. Follow -up. Yeah, no, I, okay. I wasn't saying that the construct in the Old Testament says an angel of the Lord. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it can say the angel of the Lord and refer to multiple beings, namely Michael and Gabriel. What I'm saying is that in Acts 730, after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of the burnt of a burning bush. Now this person appeared to Yahweh, but here he's saying is an angel. So what's we have to explain that dynamic. No one has seen God at any time, but all of a sudden all these people are seeing this angel and believing they saw God. You have to explain the dynamic there. Yeah, you, you did say an angel as if it wasn't the same person, and then you repeat yourself by saying it could be Michael or Gabriel. It can't be. In every case, it's referring to the same figure. Uh, it's the angel, some specific individual, one person, not uh, a bunch of figures. Moreover, uh, you, you shoot yourself in the foot by appealing to Acts 7. Go read Acts 7. It's uh, the angel who spoke to Moses from the bush. 
But uh, clearly, according to Acts 7, it was God who spoke to Moses. Uh, but uh, really, to tie this in with John, remember what John says in verse 18, a verse that Andrew never touched. No man has seen God at any time. Since the angel, the messenger of Yahweh, is explicitly identified as Yahweh by Moses and by the prophet Hosea, then we have to ask, who did he see? According to John, there's only one person who has been seen, and it's the Lord Jesus right. Christ. All right, Anthony, now here's a question uh, for you. Uh, Rogers, what do you say to the fact that John uses para, not pros, to say one person is with another? Uh, John 139, 440, 838, 1417, 23, 25, 1925. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand what their question is. The word para means from alongside, uh, but I, I might be missing the, the point that they're asking. Uh, what I was referring to, uh, first of all, that's not the uh, sentence in John 1. That's ain pros ton theon, not para. Uh, but what I was referring to, I think they might be ref uh, talking about, is uh, 11 times it talks about Jesus uh, coming. And that's further qualified by saying he came from heaven, ek tu uranu, or from the Father, apo, or from God, apo theu, um, uh, and then sometimes it says para to theu, uh, that he came from the alongside the Father. But I, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly what this person was asking. I wish they could clarify it. Um, okay, now a question for both. We can start with you, Anthony, and then Andrew can answer, and then we'll have a question for Andrew. Uh, do you think this is a matter essential to salvation? <clears throat> um, do I think it's a matter essential to salvation for instance do i don't I, the thing is like what like we get in earlier about the difference between confessing and believing right i mean it's not enough to just believe something and all of a sudden you get to go to heaven your actions and your lifestyle have to match up with the behavior that god calls us to do and we have to receive the gift that god has given us of salvation i say absolutely not it's not an issue of you need you need to accept the sacrifice of Jesus and accept that God sent Jesus and Jesus died and and it covers our sins so that we could be reconciled to God. I'd say you you probably want to believe that. But other than that, outside of that, what we're talking about here, um, I think only just clarifies our understanding of God and reality. And that may influence our behavior, which in, in turn may secondarily affect our salvation, perhaps. But primarily, I don't think whether I don't think uh, Unitarians don't get into heaven because they're Unitarians. And I don't think Trinitarians don't get into heaven because they're Trinitarians. Um, uh, Anthony, uh, try to be quick, uh, but same question to you, because that was for both. And then we'll have a question for uh, Andrew. OK, I think Andrew, for his opinion. Now, let me give you what John says in his gospel. In John 20, 31, he specifically says that to have eternal life, a person must believe in the name of the Son. I've explained what that means throughout John's Gospel. It clearly means deity. Andrew never refuted that. Jesus himself says repeatedly, you must believe in his name. And listen to this specific statement. In John 8, 24, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, ego emi, the divine name, anihu, from Deuteronomy 32, 39, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So this is a matter of eternal life or eternal death. You must believe in the Son, and you must believe it as it's laid out there in John's Gospel. Jesus is, by nature, what his Father is. All right, I gotta, I gotta respond to this. It's such an important, uh, such an important thing we're talking. About. We're talking about salvation of human souls here. This is worthy of its own discussion, and I'm, I'm willing to get into that. Um, one, it does not say that you must believe in the name of Jesus or that He's deity to be, to be saved. It says verbatim i'll quote but these words have been written so that you may believe that jesus is the messiah which is synonymous with the son of god and that by believing that he is the messiah a benefit that comes out of it that is that you may have life in his name all right so you so the thing is is we need to believe that jesus is the messiah believing that jesus is the messiah is what allows you to have life but again if you can believe that Jesus is the Messiah all day and night, and and that doesn't prove anything because that doesn't that doesn't affect your behavior and your lifestyle choices and the things that you do, which will affect your salvation. Um, yeah. 
Do I get to respond to that? Uh, very, very brief. <laughs> okay, first of all, I addressed this earlier when he tried to reduce Jesus' sonship to his messiahship, as if the messiah is not God according to the Bible. The Old Testament itself defines messiah as God. Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah 9, 6, Jeremiah 23, Malachi 3, 1. All those passages say the messiah is God, many others do as well. So believing that he's the messiah, the son of God, does not mean less than fully divine. And that was also true in the rest of John's Gospel. But I also pointed to John 8, 24, where it says, unless you believe that I am the divine name, you'll die in your sins. Believe Jesus, don't believe Andrew, who thinks John's gospel is ambiguous and requires a new revelation to now, come to a different now, idea. Now, everyone notice, whenever I tell Anthony be brief, <laughs> he says everything that he was going to say anyway, he just speaks like three times as fast. All right, so that's uh, that's what that's what uh, Anthony does. All right, now we have question for uh, Andrew. For Andrew, why did Jesus promise the Holy Spirit if he's not co-equal with God? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't know what he's trying to like. I, I think that's the type of reasoning that Trinitarians have. I mean, hey, look, guy, who's asking this question? If that's the difference between you believing what I'm telling you and not, I mean, hit me up. Uh, find me on Facebook or YouTube, and we can discuss this thing. I, I think again, it's these weird, weird things that people come up with that be like, well, Jesus had to be God because he said he's going to send the Holy Spirit, or the Father's going to send the Holy Spirit in His name type thing so that means he's god well i mean here you have a belief but you're going to have to flesh it out and you're going to have to prove it and you're going to have to give a long apology in defending your view if that's something you're going to assert is evidence that christ is god um yeah oh sorry thought i got to respond but well we're trying to we're trying to get through a few more yeah. uh questions uh andrew andrew tam in the uh super chat said for rogers if each person of the Godhead is distinct, is there some property of each the other doesn't have? If yes, does it imply a deficient personhood? If no, how do you define this distinction? And I think you already touched on that earlier in the debate a little bit uh, during the uh, during the discussion. Um, did you get the? Do I need to read the question over? Or are you good? No, no, I, I got it. Uh, so, yeah, earlier I said that if you want, you know, when people ask uh, questions like this, they have to remember they're asking a philosophical question. People can't complain if in response to a philosophical question you give a philosophical answer. The, the answer to that philosophical question is, and, and remember, we're talking about God, so I, I couldn't explain to you the full process of human birth. Uh, you know, I can't pretend to be able to fully exhaust uh, anything about the nature of God here. I'm certainly, uh, you know, at my limit uh, threshold, uh, you know, very early when, when it comes to talking about God. But the Bible itself identifies Jesus as God by essence, John 1, 1, 1, 18, 20, 28. So that can't be denied. The Bible also identifies Jesus as the Son, so there has to be some personal property distinguish him, distinguishing him. It's not an essential property, a personal property. Philosophically, those two things are distinct. Uh, so he has all the divine attributes, omniscience, omnipotence, omnibenevolence, all those things, but his personal distinguishing property is that he is begotten. Uh, the Father's property is that of paternity, uh, he begets the Son. The Son is begotten of the Father, so his uh, personal property is filiation or sonship, and the personal property of the Spirit is spiration. Uh, he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Uh, so that's my answer. All right, and another question from Andrew for, uh, I mean, another question from Andrew to Andrew. This is a different Andrew. Uh, can God choose not to exercise his will? If yes, John 638 doesn't mean Jesus isn't God. If no, the Unitarian God has no freedom to choose. I think I think we're getting it. That's a that that um again, what does he say? Does it does the father not have a will? Yeah, so so let, let, let me let me go and repeat yeah. it. Let me go and repeat it again. So he, he's asking, can God choose not to exercise his will? And if you say, uh, yes, God can choose not to exercise his will, then John 6.38 wouldn't mean that Jesus isn't God. But if you say, no, that God can't choose not to exercise his will, then you're denying God's freedom. Well, that's his claim, right? You're going to have to flesh it out, right? That's what we're doing. That's why people wonder why we do this, because we're trying to flesh out the things that we're claiming to a great depth, right? So, yes, the Father, I, I guess, I mean, if we're going to talk about philosophizing, 
and, and talk about, you know, we want to speculate about what the God can do. Can we reasonably say that's why we have philosophy so we can understand why we claim the things that may be possible, understand God through philosophy. Nothing wrong with philosophy as long as it's done uh, in the spirit and, um, and with Christ as the ultimate um, truth, right? But the Father could probably choose, I mean, the Father could will something and, um, um, I don't know. I think is. I think first of all, that's irrelevant. That the, the the truth here. The, the 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 main point here is John six thirty eight. For I have come down not to do my will. See, here's the thing. Jesus had a will. Jesus had the choice. That's all the evidence that we're given explicitly in this verse. Jesus had the choice to either listen to the father and conform his will to the father's or he had a choice to reject what the father was saying showing his will to be distinct from the father therefore showing himself to not be the sole possessor of the divine will because god's will is perfect jesus was constantly having to bend his will to conform it to god's as setting the example as we should do um, Anthony, this is a, sort of a related question. I thought you talked about this a, a little earlier, but maybe you are not clear enough. Uh, Anthony, how do you interpret that verse about Jesus coming not to do his will, but God's? So first, uh, in case uh, uh, there are people who tune into the debate le uh, late, so why don't you just tell people what the verse says and then give, give your interpretation. Yeah, well, sir, first of all, a, uh, a broad uh, answer. I'm pulling up the verse since uh, you wanted me to be specific. Um, well, anyway, so uh, broadly, uh, the, the Trinitarian position is not that there's no personal distinction between Father, Son, and Spirit, such that a person's question, uh, you know, uh, would make sense if they said, how can he be obeying the Father? He's a distinct person, uh, and our whole salvation hinges on his willingness to uh, come into the world, die for sinners, rise again from the dead, and so forth. If Jesus did not willingly submit to the Father, then we have no hope. Uh, so uh, th there's nothing about the Trinitarian position that, that makes it problematic to say that Jesus submitted to the, to the Father's will. Uh, it would be a problem if you were a modalist, the, the cult that Andrew previously uh, belonged to before getting a, a different revelation, uh, they would have a problem with this sort of thing because they think that uh, Jesus is the Father, so there's no other will to submit to. So, I mean, I, I just don't understand why, why this is even assumed to be a problem from, uh, for a Trinitarian. Jesus submitted to his Father's will. He eternally is in harmony with the Father. Father, Son, and Spirit have always worked in concert with one another. Andrew talks about Jesus uh, bending his will to the Father's will. That's not what Jesus is doing. That's never used in the New Testament. He's not bending his will like he's trying to do the opposite, uh, but, you know, forcing himself to go in the other direction. That's just not stated, certainly not stated in John's Gospel. All right, question four. Um, let's see. Question for Andrew, and then uh, maybe uh, maybe one more question for Anthony after this, and then uh, and then I'll give uh, each debater like a, a a minute to to for any final thoughts. Uh, but Ariel here says for Andrew, whose glory did Isaiah see, according to John twelve forty one? Look at the quotation in verse forty of Isaiah chapter six. Yeah, I'm surprised that one didn't come up. I mean, that's that's it a did. good one. Oh, it did. Got you. Yeah. I mean, I, I do a whole I do a whole video on this on my YouTube page, Unitarian Apologetics. If you want to go check it out and see if you can find anything that that doesn't make sense and respond to it. Um, whose glory did Isaiah see in John 12, 41? I believe the video is called right. The whole entire chapter. All right. So you break down John's gospel into two different sections. You have the first half, which is uh uh, after the prologue 1 through 12 talking about the book of signs and the second half is 13 through 21 is the book of glory in chapter 12 right before the book of glory is talking about i believe he talks about um uh the passover and it talks about the the hour that jesus had come to in order to be glorified if you read isaiah 52 and 13 i believe it is especially in this in the step two again it talks about a future glorification of jesus and you and you look at the suffering servant of isaiah 53 the verses that you know, so John writes John wrote these things after he quotes two verses which are not Isaiah 6 1 so Trinitarians like to go back and say well this you know he saw his glory and, and they scroll up to a verse that's not mentioned by John and say well that was 
Jesus' glory. Now, even if John was saying that, it would be clear that Jesus was talking about the future glory, and maybe he, he saw it and interpreted it as the future glory of Jesus on the throne, but I don't think that's what's being said. He doesn't explicitly mention Isaiah 6-1, although uh, it's a great question, but bottom line, the whole chapter and all of the context is about the future glorification of Jesus. So what glory did Jesus have? Even if Jesus returned to a glory that was he had before he was a man, it's still a glory. A uh, The word glory means a renown or a weighty opinion if we break it down. So the glory that he received after death and resurrection is still a position subordinate to the Father, eternally, infinitely subordinate to the Father. So if he returned to that, and he had that before, and he returned to it, it doesn't mean that he's God. It just means that he had a renown that was given to him, but that renown that was given to him after death was not the glory of God. It was a different, separate oh. glory. Okay, can I chime in? Oh on this? my goodness! Uh, okay, but then I have to. To be fair, I have to He's, give. Uh, I have to give Andrew uh, a follow up. You guys, he just guys, for three minutes. Everyone understands that Q and A is not a, a full debate, and that there there don't have to be responses. All right, give a quick response, Anthony. Then we're gonna give a. Uh, we're gonna allow uh, Andrew to respond to quickly to whatever you were saying. Then I have one last question for Anthony. Then you'll both sum uh, sum up real quick, and then uh, then we'll be out. Okay, I'll be quick. Uh, John does say in chapter, it does quote Isaiah 6 in John 12, when he says that uh, Isaiah saw his glory. He quotes from both Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 53, and refers to both of them and says that he saw his glory and spoke of him. If you go back to Isaiah 6, it says the angels cried out, Holy, 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 the whole earth is full of his glory. That's what John is referring to. He says, uh, Isaiah said this because he saw his glory, Christ's glory, and spoke of him. So John explicitly identifies the one as, uh, that, Jesus, uh, that Isaiah saw as Jesus. And that ties in with John 1.18. No man has seen God, but God the only begotten who's at the Father's side, he has revealed him. All right, quick follow-up, uh, Andrew, before Anthony's last question. Yeah, quick follow-up. So I didn't say that John didn't quote Isaiah 6 at all. What I said is John didn't quote Isaiah 6 1. He quotes Isaiah 6 10. All right? And then he goes six, on to— 6 uh, Or excuse me. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's you're fine. Right, Same right. thing. Uh, go look. Go watch my video. I, I go over the whole thing in detail because I know this comes a lot. And they say about the glory that someone has and it fills the earth. What about Revelation 18? I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illumined by his glory. Right. So so, so you got to understand the idea of glory there and how people you, you still you can't take an enigmatic statement and desperately try to dismiss everything we read about Jesus. There's a lot of evidence. I go over a ton of evidence in my video uh, on Unitarian Apologetics, whose glory did John see in Isaiah and, and John 12:49. All right, and a uh, final question for Anthony, and uh, I, I tried to find the hardest question on the, uh, on the, uh, in the chat for you here, Anthony. Uh, question for Anthony, John 17:22 shows Jesus is sharing the glory with his disciples. So how is it that you can use John 17, 5, Jesus sharing his glory with the Father as a way to support Jesus being God? Yeah, well, first of all, I think we can distinguish uh, the glory, the, the term glory as it's used in various contexts. You can talk about the glory of man. Uh, it talks about uh, you know various senses of the word glory, God's glory, uh, Christ's mediatorial or messianic glory. I would say that in John 17, 5, Jesus is talking about the divine glory that he had with the Father because it specifically says, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you, not that was predestined, the glory that I had with you before the world became. It's a glory he shared with the Father, so it must be uh, the same kind of glory. Moreover, it's an eternal glory. He had it before the world became, even came into existence. That The glory that he's giving to the disciples is not an eternal glory. It's not a glory they had with the Father from all eternity. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the disciples are, are just simply not... Uh, so, I, I, again, I would say that, uh, I should point this out, It's he's referring to that mediatorial glory that will be his as a consequence of winning redemption for people. That's the glory that he's going to give the disciples, not the eternal divine glory that belongs exclusively to God, and he won't give to another. 
All right, and uh, now we'll just have uh, basically a one one minute uh, summary here at the uh, at the end. Uh, who wants to go first? Is the one Anthony want to go ahead and uh, just give basically final thoughts, sixty seconds. Yeah, I just want to thank Andrew for the debate. Um, I don't really need to make any further comments, I don't think, about the substance of it. I, I think people can watch the debate and decide for themselves. I think that Andrew several times you know, said, erase this, erase that. He thought that that's something I felt any, some need to do, but I think he was secretly uh, begging me, begging us to erase it because he doesn't want it to be seen. I'm, I'm being facetious here, Andrew. Uh, I did like the feistiness, like I said. I thank you for the debate. Uh, I enjoyed it. I hope people learn from it. I hope you benefited from it. And I do hope that everybody will take to heart the words of Jesus in John 8, 24, when he said, unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. All right, Andrew, and you get the last word, uh, about 60 seconds or so. Yeah, sure. I'm glad he brought that up again. Uh, you know, unless you believe that I am. See, this enigmatic statement Jesus says, and it's just a license for Trinitarians to dismiss everything that Jesus said. Let's let's just scratch the context. Let's scratch what Jesus said about himself. Let's scratch everything that's being said in the whole entire chapter. But Jesus said, I am. Man, that must mean he's God. Again, the shortest route possible. Enigmatic statements, especially made in John. I mean, we're going to start believing that people ate Jesus, you know, I mean, it, John says some things that you just can't you can't start promoting cannibalism because you want to take the shortest route possible. He says, I believe I am using the same thing. He's establishing his permanences as the savior of the world, as the mediator of salvation. Moses said in a, an assumption of Moses that God formed me to, and before the foundation of the world, I was created to be what a mediator of the covenant salvation the jews in the context believed that they were saved because they were descendants of abraham but jesus is saying you need to believe that i am what the messiah what because we go back i believe it's in mark and and, and the high priest says uh just tell us plainly are you the son of god and he says ego and me and you will see me at the right hand of power okay so he's saying i am i am the messiah all right. Thank you, Andrew and Anthony, for that debate. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for uh, for a good portion. We had uh, over a thousand people watching live. Uh, I know there were lots of questions we didn't get to, but I'm sure we'll be having uh, more debates in the future. So keep your questions and we'll uh, we'll we'll hopefully get to those in the future. I've, I've been told to announce that uh repeatedly that to announce that sam is going live afterwards i cannot do that uh no one is going to go watch that notice thousand thousand plus viewers live what does sam get 100 150 why because he blocks everyone so if you want to get blocked over to sam and uh if not then uh... <laughs> all right all right well everyone uh i will catch you all next time and i'll be going live uh, later this week with uh, brother rashid um uh, got a message from Hatoon. Hopefully that's uh, about going live this week. Um, other than that, uh, you can follow both these guys on their channels. Catch you all later. Thank you, guys.